Hello and welcome to Free Cheese, episode 354. I'm your Joe Dix, joined by Matt Selner. Hello. The Free Cheese is a weekly video game podcast about video games, brought to you once a week by thefreecheese.com. Matt, are you ready to talk about the future of video games? Oh, yeah, been ready. We got a Still big, ready. big, big show this week after our first look at some games for the PlayStation 5. A new entry in a classic beloved video game franchise to talk about later on. The Destiny expansions. Uh, crazy indie bundles. A thousand games. This is a big... We got a big show. It's as big as that bundle. I don't know if anything's as big as that bundle. <laughs> the bundle is just a uh, black hole that continues to just amass... Uh, anything within its proximity. But it's like that cool black hole that you're like, oh man, that looks cool, I want to go in it. Oh, I've never said that a black hole is not cool. Oh. Mm. I would never say that. Don't you ever say <laughs> that I said that. What, is this How black is that, hole this, street huh? or vert? <laughs> street. You kidding? Come on. It's an easy one. Give me a, give me a hard one. How's Matt doing this week? Good. Uh, another week. I'm no, it's not another week. It's a big week. Well, all right, it's a big week. It's exciting, and we, you know, we've hung out. Well, not hung out, but like, you know, we virtually it's... hung out more so than usual. Yes, but you also had a big week for another reason. I don't even remember. Well, it hasn't arrived yet, but oh maybe yeah, something to celebrate. Oh yeah, I got finally. I won the game called "Can You Find a Ring Fit?" <laughs> Boom. I Start won that firing. game. I finally won it on Nightmare Difficulty uh, on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> was it Thursday? Like around four. Mm. Um, with uh, some help with the Ring Fit Reddit um, and some other just like stock, some of those stock websites and stuff like that, I saw that like Amazon and Best Buy kept popping up stock and i noticed mm-hmm. it was coming up like every hour hour and a half two hours or so so it was kind of one of those things where we just kind of keep checking every like 15 minutes or so but finally finally i uh using the best buy app and having my shipping address and my payment stuff <laughs> all ready to go uh went ahead and finally got myself a ring fit which will be arriving two days after this goes up now it was th- Three days after, and then it's got an email this morning saying Bumping. it's going to be your Wednesday. Uh, and this is like right after you had felt the the pain and sorrow of not being able to order it from some French website that you were yeah being that translate day. to navigate. What a what a fucking fun experience that was of navigating a French website. And this is like on iPad, and like I know I know I have the keyboard and stuff, but I'm still like not used to tabs and multitasking on an iPad so much as I am on a computer. So, like, me going back and forth, like, translating, like, key French things while I'm filling out my payment and stuff was, like, very slow. <laughs> so, uh, uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, was it FNAC, FNAC or something? I don't know. Uh, it, it's some French five retailer. Nights at, five Nights at Charlie's? Sure, yeah. Right, um, cool. They, uh, they had ring fits in, in the morning when I woke up, and I was, I was I had one in my car, and I was going through the whole thing, but because it was in French, I wanted to make sure I was putting things in the right field, and I wasn't getting totally messed up, because, you know, I don't know French. So I was, like, slowly doing it, and I finally got through, and when I hit submit, I knew my car was going to get declined, because it's a French retailer, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, I... I hit submit and I was like waiting for like the message to pop up saying, "Hey, this is weird," and for me to yeah. say yes. When I hit yes and I went to re uh, redo it, they removed my ring fit from the cart because they sold out. Fuck. So you actually got a notification that it was weird and you could bypass it. Yeah. So Nintendo doesn't fuck around because I tried plugging in my. American credit card information into the Japanese eShop. And as soon as I went to go buy a game, the Switch gave me an error that was like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that, I didn't, it didn't even make it to that card. Like it. Oh, really? Oh. Like Switch didn't, Switch was like, this is not a Japanese card. Fuck you. Cause I, like, I have two cards that you can use internationally. Yeah, they were cool with it. They were, 
Um, and I used while in Japan, no problem. But just registering, I think it's because the Japanese eShop looks for an American or a Japanese address to be associated. Uh, whatever. No region free, deal. baby. I Region free, except for that part. You can put the account on. You just can't get shit. Uh, no, it, no. It, my card converted everything to euros, and like they, there was a conversion rate to it or whatever. And actually, like with the shipping and stuff, it was only going to be, I think, like eight dollars more than I would have that end up spending. So like it wasn't like you know when it's the first one I've seen in forever. That, you know, yeah. I'm not I'm not mad about eight dollars more than what it would be here at stateside, but it yeah. all ended up working out. I'm happy that it's slowly coming back in stock. I mean, it took. A while longer than I thought it would, but that's cool. I'm curious to hear how that journey Yeah, I'm goes. excited to play. I'm excited to just, like, I don't know. I, I, tried, I tried the running thing, but I don't have the right shoes. And there's a store I would go to that's nearby that does, like, good fittings and stuff like that and tells you, like, good shoes for your feet. But because of all of this, uh, I think they've recently reopened, but, like, they've been closed. So, like, yeah, the running kind of... Yeah, I, there was like three days where my knees, they felt like I was 80 years old. Yeah. Yeah, they, they didn't feel all that great. So I'm just happy I can do something a little bit active. Yeah, it's definitely that. And you can run in place with this, but if that starts to feel like shit, there's a mode you can switch it to so that it's, you're doing like hyper squats, like not full squats. You're just kind of like, you're kind of like dry humping the air in a way, if yeah. that helps. Yeah. Uh, So if you're down with some... Dry humping. Yeah. Air humping, yeah. <laughs> you can do that instead of running. But they do that dry for hump folks. Adventure. <laughs> dry <laughs> They do I they do it for uh they call it quiet mode. And it's I think it's less about being easier on the knees and more about if you live in an apartment or something where someone's below you and you can't jog in place. You yeah. can do that so you can just kind of like that, that could be a very real future for me here soon. Yeah, it's it's cool. I did it on days where I my knees did hurt or my like feet hurt or I like because I spent a couple days where instead of doing the actual adventure I was just running which yeah. was fun and and a nice break because remember they added that jogging mode so you can just like go through with no fights or anything and doing that for like a few days in a row I was like all right I need to give the running a break and just do some whatever but I didn't want to not do the adventure stuff. Well, we've kind of already rolled into talking about what we've been playing. Not really, but what you're going to play. But we could talk about the last week in what we've played through. Uh, and I've we talked beforehand. We've got quite a list ahead of us. Do you want to just uh, volley this thing back and forth here? Yeah, we'll do a little volley. You want to start with a new thread or you want to close a thread that you may have left open from last Let's week? Let's close. Let's close Hit me. The Witcher 3. Uh, I've completed the main quest, uh, and I think I've kind of uh, tied my bow with that game. Um, and it was really good. It's just like I don't want to. I think I don't want to go into the expansions on Xbox. I feel like that's a thing. Like I would rather have that on my PC or a potential next gen console, maybe even. Yeah. Um, but no, did they I do the really... cloud save stuff in there? Sorry, huh? Did they do the cloud save stuff with the Xbox version? I don't think so. Because I know with so. like the Switch version, you can sign into GOG or Steam and transfer your cloud save. They never asked me for my GOG information, and I don't know without that would them be sick if you could pull your progress that would be from cool. Xbox. I mean, that would be cool, but I do want to replay the game because I got the bad ending, evidently. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. Yeah, so uh, that's one of the things, uh, without getting the spoilers, I really liked. Like, I thought I was doing... like these right things making the right decisions and they got me to the bad ending which you know it kind of sucks in a way but like it's uh, that's good like i don't know and not i know i was comparing this to mass effect 2 last week it did not do the mass effect 3 uh palette swap there are three legitimately different endings i think there's multiple and like more to it but uh like three major like main quest endings uh but they do like the uh i don't know like if you've ever beaten like a fallout where they do like the um it's not like in game cutscenes, but like they do like the little art and then the subtitle like text stuff and tell you like what happened to other characters. So uh, so they have a lot of that stuff for some of the decisions you made, um, which were cool. And some of the decisions I made ended up being really good in that way, but like my main quest with Geralt did not end in the in the best way. But no, I it's a really good game. I, I do recommend 
playing it and like I you know you can get lost in it for 80 100 hours and that's just the base game right but like you know I got through what I thought was a good amount of that game um you know side quests I didn't do a lot of the Witcher quests at the end of the day but I did some but still like even without me doing them it wasn't because you know I didn't want to do them it was more like you know I just kind of wanted to to get to end the game I felt like my my ride with the game was was starting to slow so yeah, I, like it, it's it's a really really good game. I don't know like what else to say about it. Um, I will say though, one last thing: I did achieve the greatest achievement of all. I got all the Gwen cards. How hard was that in the end? That you was more of a. We're a little concerned. That was more of a grind than hard. The only thing you have to be careful of is when you get Gwent related side missions to make mm-hmm. sure you stick with the Gwent cards. So there were, there's a side quest with uh, Zoltan where he is trying to acquire three like the rarest Gwent cards. At the end of the at the end of the uh, thing when you get all three of them, he will either sell he, just because you went through hell and back. He was just like, all right, well at this point, like, do you want the cards yourself for for your deck or do you want me to pay you for the cards? And so like. If you don't take the cards then, you'll never get them because they're only available in that quest. And there's a couple of things like that along the way. Like, there's a high-stakes tournament. Um, and that was the one I was kind of safe-scumming a little bit. But, like, th- those, th- that was, like, the hardest opponents I've ever had. Like, I faced the entire game when it came to Gwent. And, uh, yeah, like, if you did not beat that tournament, you wouldn't have gotten, like, one or two cards uh, that you would have you would have gotten. So, like, the end of it, really, all you have to do is just play new NPC characters. And whenever you beat an NPC character, you get a card. Um, if you've beaten them before, you won't get a card. You'll just get, like, some kind of other, like, eh, something for your alchemy or it's something, right? Um, but it won't be a card. See, the key is to find all the unique NPCs or enough of the unique NPCs to get those cards. Because some of those cards you can only get randomly. So, um... Yeah, it's just a matter of going through that grind and kind of making like a checklist. And there's good resources online to help you out with that. So, uh, yeah, no, uh, the, the, I, I had a little bit of scare. I thought there was a quest that I may have, uh, quote unquote, failed, but it's because I moved the story along after the story mission I all missed. Um, but uh, no, it ended up working out because you can get another that that type of card another way uh, randomly, and that, the. It's a unique design on the card, and like the card art's unique from that mission. But the game for the achievements only tracking that I have that card called Necker. So it's it, it ended up working out because there's three of them with unique arts, and I had two of them. So it all worked out. That was fun though. But yeah, no, if you got time, uh, even if it's just like thirty to forty hours, and you're looking for something like this, it is a really good game. Um, if you can get through the grind of it feeling hard and difficult in like the first couple hours, everything get, it gets better. Your power, you feel like a real badass uh, by the end of this game. That's dope. And you're still so. Does that just edge you higher for Cyberpunk at this point? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, even at this point, like I know God knows it took forever for Cyberpunk, but like I'm at the point now too where they came out after Cyberpunk and they're like. Witcher 4 or whatever. Yeah. I'd be game for it. So, um, yeah, no, I, I'm very happy with my experience there. Nice. All right, volley uh, back well, to you. I, Here we go. I guess, uh, yeah, catching the volley, I will I'm gonna do a little... I'll, I'll hit you with a new one. How about this? The new new, all right. The Messenger. All right. Well, not new on the podcast, but new for you. Yeah, I hadn't played it. We talked about it back when it came out. Mark was really into it, and then you played a bunch of it before uh, Game of the Year. I wouldn't say a bunch. I played enough to kind of learn what that game is, but then I learned that I didn't learn what that game is because I never got to that point. That's the weird thing about this is they couldn't advertise that game without telling you that it starts as 8-bit, and then there's a shift where you're playing 16-bit. But boy, if they could, it would have such a strong impact of like surprise and genuine shock. Because 
what's really cool, I mean, I dug into the development side of it too, just to see a little bit of like what that team, they're like, you know, what they wanted to do and how they achieved it. They actually went, um, they, they tried to stay as close to the color palette of the NES for the eight bit stuff. And then the Genesis for the 16 bit stuff so much so that they used, uh, there's some really popular tools for music making for both of those. So there's family tracker, which is a, uh, music creation tool specifically for Famicom and NES stuff that Jake Kaufman used for like all the Shovel Knight stuff and a lot of that, uh, those games. And then there's one called Devil Mask. I think I'm saying that right. And that's the Devil Mask you can use for Game Boy and you can use for whatever, but Genesis is a big one for that. It's got really, really good, uh, Genesis sound emulation. And it was all, all the music was made in each of those respectively for the different eight and 16 bit, soundtracks um but yeah so playing it uh it's on game pass for pc which is where i jumped in and played a, a bunch of it i made it through the 8-bit section i saw it change over to 16 and i haven't really touched it since i think i did one level on the 16-bit side um and then i, I kind of haven't touched it but i really love how the character feels i love how the character moves i think that it feels as close to perfect for a ninja game that you want like i was playing it and it plays how you remember not unlike how shovel knight is right like where shovel knight feels like an unearthed nes cart that just like wait what how did they do this um this feels like you remember ninja gaiden feeling and i ended up going back and playing ninja gaiden and subsequently shinobi and thinking like that's how they and they they're a little bit stiffer and i think it's it's really in the number of frames of animation i think in the character here in the messenger but it just it feels really really good to play um, and for this, I know that a big draw was the shopkeeper's dialogue. Uh, that was, you know, a big thing here. And I kind of quickly grew tired of how clever the writing thought it was being. For me, it seemed a little bit too, like, I don't know, man. It just, it rubbed me the wrong way in like, it didn't go as far as like Wes Anderson it, movies. Huh? I, was, yeah, I honestly don't remember a lot of it at this point. So I don't remember. It was just a lot of that stuff to me that felt like, hey, don't you get it? Don't you get it? Like, look how clever we're being. Aren't I cute? Um, it was that kind of stuff. And I was kind of like, okay, cool. Like, it was fine, but it none of it, whatever. But then there was a part where suddenly you go into the shop and the whole thing, you're always, there's this fucking cabinet, right? And you guys talked about the cabinet. Um, but there's a cabinet and you can't open the cabinet. And every time you touch it, the shopkeeper's like, don't fucking touch the cabinet. There's one point where you walk in and the shopkeeper's not behind the the desk or the, uh, the whatever the fuck counter and you go over to the I just kind of made my rounds through because every time I walk into that shop I like click the chest at the beginning click the thing talk to the shopkeeper like you have a rhythm and I just went over and touched it and he comes in from the door and he's like oh did you think it would be that easy that I just wasn't here so you just open it now well it's still locked please don't touch it and then he says something and like his dialogue keeps going and it gets to a point where the dialogue just keeps going and he keeps like changing what he's saying. And then he's like, okay, I'm done now. I'm not going to say anything else. Um, you can leave now. You can stop asking me whatever. So you do it again. And he's like, ah, shit. Okay. I thought that would work telling you that I wasn't going to do it. And maybe you'd think that I was out of new things to say. So you press him again. Like It keeps going and it gets to the point where he's like, Okay, what if I tell you that if you keep asking me stuff, I'm going to give you a really long story that you can't skip. And you keep go like you just keep pushing. It's a really long cutscene that plays out. But then like it kind of turns a little bit and he doesn't quite break the fourth wall, but he gets to a point where his dialogue he just has this like sense of like uh, humanity in his voice and I think like there's a sense of like genuity behind the stories he's telling all of a sudden he talks about like personal growth and he talk he's like kind of gives a new weight to everything he's been saying that it, it kind of gave me a new lens in which to view all of the previous dialogue even the stuff that i kind of like rolled my eyes at like okay yeah you're clever haha um i started looking at that differently so then the next time next few times i went through to a shop thing and there was a new story to hear a new piece of dialogue that i previously maybe would have rolled my eyes at and been like okay i get it um it stopped feeling so cheesy at that point. It had a little bit more weight behind it. 
I, yeah, I want to go back to that and at least see it through to the end. But it's cool because playing through the 8-bit side of it, you'd feel genuinely like you beat a an 8-bit game. Like it, it feels like about that length. I don't remember how many levels there are. It might be eight. But it's a good chunk of, you know, and it's like solid boss fights, solid platforming, solid level design. Like everything through and through feels like a really good NES game. Um, so I'm, just, I'm excited to play a really good Genesis game after the fact. <laughs> so you got through the, so you're at the 16, are you far into that or? I No, it's literally like one stage through. Cool. Um, but it's cool. Like your character changes his, his look. Um, obviously the whole world changes its look, but yeah, there's, there's a lot that shifts, but it, it feels like you're playing a sequel to the same game all within the same game, which is neat. I, there's another game that did that at some point near near. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but near automata had that where you're like, you get to a point where you're like, Oh my God, this is, this is a whole new it's just it, there's such a such a good sense of completion in both of those, where like you're like oh my god I I fucking beat it and then it's like oh my god there's more, um, which well, is cool not at, I, I, not at first, not that part but like when you got to the the, the yeah. C storyline in near where you're like oh my god I can't believe like how brand new this feels, and this too I, I think um, works really well. All right, well. I made a rule that I broke once already, but I can officially talk about Warzone again. There it is. <laughs> Battle Pass. Tell me about all the new hot changes in Call of Duty Warzone. Well, let me tell you what. They released the Battle Pass, and I can't believe what they did with the map, man. All those all those conspiracy theories and all those yeah. little hints about a nuclear, and people are talking about the dam. And then it was like a 50 gig patch, of course, because this game's sure. fucking humongous. I thought it was 84 gigs. I don't, I don't know. I purposely let Battle.net on overnight to make sure it got it and it was just ready. Uh, of course, I had to still install shaders, but eh, well, that's another story. But yeah, no, man, it was just like, man, what can they put into this game? And they did nothing to the Warzone <laughs> map. Which is like kind of disappointing because I'm. I think I'm ready for that change now. Is it? Is there like a hint of anything to come? Like, do you think? Because you were talking about how they're leading up to uh, announcing the next Call of Duty, and maybe there would be something to tie into that. Like, do you think that that got delayed with some of the other stuff? Or so, um, you know, they they of course have added things to Warzone and, and did some changes. And uh, one of the things I was going to bring up, there's an interesting new quest. And I don't think I noticed it until this battle pass. Uh, but then again, I, I like it's in a weird spot. So and it's just I don't really look in that spot too often or pay attention. So when you're in your like the lobby, you can see the missions and your challenges like your dailies or whatever on the right side for XP. But when you're in game, you can also hit escape and bring up the pause menu um, and see those same challenges. But in that pause menu, I've noticed now that there is a new like Intel string of quest involved in something. So like the first one was get come to this location for your first piece of Intel. And it was a picture of TV station, which is kind of like right in the central part of Verdansk, which is the Warzone map. So I was like, huh. So... Me and a random that we uh, we played a- together a couple times at this point, we noticed that, and he had the same thing. So we both kind of decided to drop in a TV station, try to fight it out, and then like kind of explore TV station a little bit and see what's going on. Well, we found the intel, and then like it- in it, it said about it was like a like a document, um, and it was saying about blah blah blah, uh, you know the ex. I we recommend um, um, evacuations from the airport, which airport is another area in the Verdance map at gate B. I forget the the gate name, but a specific gate. So we're like, well, fuck it, let's just follow the you know, let's just make this a weird game of war zone. So we started, we headed back to the airport, and then we got to the gate, um, and there is a specific gate that says that gate number that they were talking about, but the we didn't find anything. And we were looking, but we, like we weren't looking hard. And the way they have it for the next step of it, it just says like evacuations are underway. So when we couldn't find anything, because the the TV station one, it kind of stuck out like a sore thumb almost. 
Um, so the fact that it wasn't sticking out again, I thought maybe it was going to be one of those things like, oh, well, we I've seen Destiny put out like a piece of content like once a week. Maybe it's something like that is going to lead to something at the end of the Battle Pass or at the end of this mission, which might be like six weeks. Like, who knows? Um, but then after I logged off, it was still bothering me that I didn't know the answer. So I kind of looked it up. And it, no, it is a whole quest line. We just didn't look in a certain area. Or we didn't think to look in a certain area near the gate. We were more inside the gate. So um, I haven't gone back to do the intel stuff. But it seems like there's a whole quest thread. And uh, I haven't spoiled it for myself. So I'm kind of curious to see what what happens and what that may lead to. Or what that may hint at, uh, potentially. I think that's cool because it adds like another layer of interactivity with... Uh, like The beauty of those games, of any type of battle royale, the, the way that that genre works is because it's always new, right? It's always going to be different just inherently. It's never going to be the same back to back, but that can grow tiring in a way, right? Like, oh, I feel yeah, like there's yeah. still a thrill to it, but I think like having that other stuff and it keep coming back to this, like this has been our theme in the last like six podcasts, but that emergent storytelling that happens through that stuff. And this seems a little less emergent than, than other examples we've talked about. But I think the idea of having something different to do than just, drop in, run, kill, try to win, um, mm-hmm. having an, another, another thing, um, especially because it seems like, right, like everyone has kind of that same thing, so you might run into other players by accident. Yeah, uh, like, you're I, all trying I don't to do know. I don't drop in the TV station a lot, but I feel like a lot of people were dropping the TV station when it, even when like yeah. the flight path was like not ideal. Because it took yeah, us like three to times there. to survive TV station for us to like explore. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, but now like I gotta go to airport, but airport is potentially another like crowded area that, you know, I have to get to. So uh, it, it is making me drop into places that I maybe wouldn't like TV station airport. Um, you know, I, I go there like depending on the flight path and stuff. I, I have no problems going there, but there's other areas of the map, like the prison, which is in the corner. Like I hardly ever drop in there. But, like, if there's now a piece of intel, well, guess what? I'm going to be doing those games until I get that piece of intel. I'm going to be trying to go right. to the prison. And, you know, it very well may go in there because I know, like, there is a gulag area in the prison. Like, it's not the actual gulag, but you, it's the remnants of, like, another type of gulag. So, I don't know. That's that's interesting. I thought that was unique. Um, just the other things they added. Um, this is just multiplayer, but they had a couple new maps. A new map for Ground War, which is their big 64-player uh, battlefield-type mode. Um, they added like a little 2v2 or 3v3 map called Trench, which is like a very small portion of another map that, uh, that they have, which, uh, was actually, I played on it once. It was kind of cool. Um, it's just like, it's a bunch of trenches, like dugout trenches, but like you can go over top of them, but if you go over top of them, you can be seen easily. So it's about like a give and take. Uh, we played, uh, Domination or I played Domination on it and it was unique because A and C were at the opposite ends of the trench. Uh, which isn't that big. You run to it in like 10 seconds. But uh, the B one was on top. So it was like like constantly dying trying to overtake the B, the B capture point. So that was, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, they brought back Scrapyard. I, I, I think I said this one a while ago. But it seems like Modern Warfare is just becoming a best of Modern Warfare previous uh, battle right, right, uh, right. maps. They brought back Scrapyard, uh, which was a map that I really liked from Modern Warfare 2. So um, uh, that's that was kind of cool to see that back. Um, and then Warzone itself, like I said, the map didn't change, which is kind of disappointing. But they did add a, a few new things. Um, they added new m- new types of contracts. So you already have the three existing ones uh, with Scavenger Hunt, the Recon uh, Take, and the um, the Bounty Hunts. They brought back that Most Wanted thing that they implemented and took out. So most wanted, if you uh, are not familiar, is when you mark yourself as a bounty target. And if you survive, you uh, get money, uh, I think a couple pieces of equipment. But the payoff for it is you get auto revives. So I don't know how it works in solo, but I think in duos, like you still have to go to the buy station to buy someone back, but it's free. So there is a, there's a big advantage to... to to survive in that for three minutes, but as a three, a long three minutes, and you are marked specifically, like not even like an area, like you are marked. It's, so yeah, you're just. It is. It is radar. very. It, it's a very high high risk high reward play there. Um, 
They have a new thing called contraband, so you might see these little drops, uh, and you, what you do is you call in this chopper. Uh, and Modern Warfare has these blueprints for guns. It's a good way of letting you see some of the unlocks or some unique builds to weapons that you might not think about, and they come with, like, you know, their own, like, custom paint that you, you, you can't get otherwise. Um, but what's cool is if you do these contraband, you actually they, – they st- Drop the the blueprint gun. You'll get a cash reward, but that blueprint now becomes part of your permanent collection to use in Modern Warfare. However, so you can use it in Warzone as your loadout. You can use it uh, in multiplayer or whatever. So it's a real cool way to get some permanent things um, and and just to get some attachments for guns that you might not use that you, you may want to use that you don't have like the levels on. Uh, and then the added events. Um, so these can happen randomly. Uh, between the time of the first circle, I think, started and closed, and before the end of the gulag period. Um, jailbreak. So whoever's in the gulag when this is announced, you just leave the gulag. You're, you're back in the map. So um, that's, that was kind of cool to see. You just start seeing all these players just drop it in randomly. Um, another one called Fire Sale. So um, stuff at the buy station just becomes super cheap. So you just buy all these UAVs and just start launching them off and all these all, all these other kill streaks and all that good stuff. And then there's another one I thought was really cool. It's called Supply Chopper. So when this event happens, like five or six Supply Choppers just start flying over. And we'll, they, they're not armed, but if you take them down, they'll crash and they'll drop like the most lucrative, best loot in the world um, that you can get. Like all kinds of money, UAVs, uh, I think high... like. Like high grade weapons, like the the super rare ones, yeah. rocket like grenade launchers, like the really really good stuff. Um, so like that happens, so you start shooting, but like the penalty for shooting it is like you like you could see someone shooting it, and when it crashes, it's marked for everyone, even if you didn't shoot it down. So it just becomes like the traditional supply crates back Crate, from like yeah. PUBG. So um, yeah, they they added some. It's it's cool. It's kind of shook, shook up the meta a little bit. Uh, at, at, when I was playing it um, at different points this week, but um, but it is nice just so, to. Uh, I was gonna say with the battle pass, it is kind of nice just to have because I maxed out everything last season. So I really, when I was playing, I wasn't really like getting anything. It's nice to yeah. start getting that sense of reward again for for playing a lot. Do you think that this kind of stuff will lead to? changes in the map or like a different like injection of story beats or something or is it more like how apex kind of didn't know what they had until it was out there and that first the second season of apex was kind of weak and then season three started to do some weird shit for even weirder like do you think that they're kind of in like a oh we didn't expect it to be this big and we're seeing like the aftermath of them trying to scream i don't know like where do you see this going i I don't think it's that. I mean, Apex was weird because it didn't have, like, the name behind it. They said it was related to Titanfall, but it, they didn't want to advertise that, or they would have said Titanfall, whatever. Yeah. So, like, I think the case of they didn't know what they have is real there, but, like, this is Activision. This is Call of Duty. This is very much Call of Duty Warzone. So, Yeah, but I don't know that they knew that with Warzone... I'm saying, like, because, I mean, this stuff takes time to develop, right? So the Apex stuff, like, they had seasons one and two done before they launched the first thing, right? Like, and and the season three stuff was developed after season one had gone live. Like, do you think that Call of Duty is in a similar spot where they're, maybe we're seeing now the output that they had planned before launch, it launched, and now they're, like, whatever, I don't know. Like maybe halfway through this season or the next season is the one where they start taking into consideration some of that. Yeah, but like I, like I, I, I can I can see that argument, but the other part of it is they're not the second game to do this now. Like they they are like the fifth or sixth major triple A one to enter this market now. I mean they've they, they've already had one right. They with Black Ops Four with Blackout. So this is their second entry. And what is what probably six or seven major entries in this uh, in this BR genre. So like the roadmap is it's laid out, and you've seen different successes with different um, and different unique ways that different companies have taken it. So like PUBG just seems to constantly put out new maps, like just totally like part of the queue new maps. 
Fortnite has gone the, the way of like, all right, we're going to adapt the map and we're going to make different seasons. And hell, at this point, they even made like Fortnite 2, whatever. Sure. Uh, to kind of remap, to relaunch the map in a way. So like, I don't know. I, I think you just, it's it's hard to argue them sitting back and because, you know, they don't know what they have. I, I think it's, you, you, at some point, yeah, you don't want to necessarily follow the roadmap to a T, but you... You you're you're so late into the entry, and you've seen the successes and the failures of other ones that you can start borrowing from those things and just adapt them and give them the Call of Duty twist. I mean, because think of it, this game has adapted. One of the reasons I like it so much is because I don't have the inventory UI. Like that is so clean, yeah. right? That I never have to worry about dragging and dropping things. The armor system, there's no tiers to it. It's just a matter of how much armor do you have on with the plate system. Like yeah. they have adapted that stuff that I do not like in other BRs. Um, to to just this unique way and i want to see them keep doing that but i just like the map we're getting to the point now where you see fortnite changing their map every season you see apex starting to change their map every season call it it's time for call of duty to catch up because verdance is going to get boring here sooner rather than later at this point well speaking of online video games matt that took way much that took way longer than i thought it was going to be i apologize (laughs) No, I um, I said last week when we did our little brief wrap up. What are you going to play this week? I in passing threw out maybe Fantasy Star Online two, and even as I said it, I was like, "You're not going to fucking play that, Matt." Within hours of us finishing recording, I had that installed on my computer. I opened it. It then installed for real that time because it's one of those fun outdated PC launchers where you need to install, then install, then install. Uh, but it, eventually, Saturday, I was playing some Fantasy Star Online 2, and I have kind of kept up with that game throughout the week to a point now where I understand it more. We, You and I played that beta back on Xbox a while back, and it was kind of like, uh-uh. Like, okay, I get it. I see what this is. I don't think that we really experienced it, though, at the time. Like, we did one mission, and it was kind of like, all right, got it. Um, now that I've spent, uh, I forget what my hour count is now. I'm like, maybe approaching, th- it can't be 30 hours. I don't know, it's up there. Maybe 20, something like that. Uh, this kind of took over the Monster Hunter itch for me. Monster Hunter is still good, but I was playing Monster Hunter on Xbox, and this being on PC, I think, like my Xbox is down here in the basement where I also work, so... Physically being in the office where the computer is, is a nice just change of location for me. So I wanted something that like got me out and whatever. So being on the PC, I think I like that for Fantasy Star versus Monster Hunter. But it also scratches the Monster Hunter itch in a more light way. Like the Monster Hunter stuff being, it's it's an investment, right? Like when I jump into Monster Hunter, you need to sit down for, okay, this is going to be a 50, you know, 30 minute plus whatever. Fantasy Star, I can jump in and it can be, let me just do a quick pass through the dungeon or let me spend the next, what I think is going to be two hours, psych, I just played this for six and a half hours without realizing it kind of thing. Um, So I think generally just to kind of like set the, like what is Fantasy Star Online 2? It is a free to play MMORPG where the main hook of the game is dungeon crawling through randomly generated dungeons in a third person point of view. Uh, and your class will determine what your play style is. And your class can be switched at any time. Um, you Each class has its own level. So you change that as you want. Um, you have one character that you can then change to any of the classes. Each one levels up to a max of 75. And as you level up, you get more skill points to change your skill tree out. As you play the game, you get different weapons, gear, etc. that you equip along the way. And the more I got into that dungeon crawling loop and playing it and getting new weapons, um, the weapons don't change so much, but as you level up, you will find new weapon skills and you can apply those to your weapon skills. So each weapon you can apply up to 12 different attacks to um, and you can rotate them in and out. So... You equip yourself with three weapons, 
and each of those three weapons has 12 different skills you can use. So you have 36 different kind of things you can be doing at one time. For me, my class is a ranger, so it's short to long range combat. It's all gun focused, but you do have the ability to equip like a gun blade sword. So you're kind of like using a sword, but then also it can also shoot. It's just, it's usually like single fire shots that you don't, you know, they're kind of going to be like an add add on attack, not your primary. Um, but I have a grenade launcher or an assault rifle and the, uh, gun blade. And it's been cool. Like unlocking different things. Like I, I just got one where you shoot and also jump backwards. So it's a nice like evasion technique while still staying on the offense and getting out of the way of a big powerful boss. But I think what's been most cool about this. So, you know, you jump in and it's like, it is, I think it's a bad game, right? But it's also a really good game. And that's the the conflict that I'm having with this. Like, there's so much, and there's so much of this game that this came out almost a decade ago. This is like 2012 was when it first released in Japan. And it feels like it. Like, it has a lot of that stuff in it. There's so many menus. There's It's a free-to-play MMO, too, right, from Japan. So, it, like, just inherently knowing that it's free-to-play MMO from Japan, you kind of know or expect or assume, right? Um, it came out at a time where the mobile market was emerging and some of those trappings are in there and they've only like gotten worse over time with that. None of it's ever to a point where like, oh, this sucks and this, you know what I mean? Like it never feels too, too bad. Um, but it's definitely there, right? Like that's the way you unlock a lot of the new cosmetic stuff is through scratch tickets. Uh, which you can get the scratch tickets with in-game currency, or you can spend real cur- real dollars to get fake dollars to buy the scratch tickets for. Um, the cool thing is with Xbox Game Pass, I don't know if it's... I think it might be an ultimate perk. I think there is something from a Game Pass perk, but there's also ultimate perks on top of it that give you, like, some of the... I think I got, like, the Battle Pass for free. I got... Um, I don't remember an Xbox jacket, a fucking Xbox controller that I can hold in my hand as an accessory. Like there's just silly, dumb stuff like that. That's neat. But generally what's been cool about it is I don't know what the hell's going on in the story. Don't ask. I, some guys should, whatever. I mean, to be the, fair, we don't know what the hell's going on in destiny too. So, right. But this is like, I've done the story and it's, it's really just like cutscenes that slowly play out and there's a bad guy and then there's a good people. And, I have no idea. The thing that's been nice for me is you go in and there are like operations you have to do and there's different, uh, you get like bonuses or what do you call them? Uh, daily orders, which are kind of like your daily quests or, or, uh, bounties in destiny or anything like that. Like any of these games have these kind of like go here and do kill 20 of these things. So as you collect those types of things, it pushes you to go to different areas and try different things. And also the main story is kind of pushing you to go on these expeditions and explore this land versus that land. So a lot of what I've done on my own and with Mark is just jump in and go to the forest, go to the Skyland, go to like all the different areas and just wander through. And it, it, it's cool. Like it's always a randomly generated layout of the map. So you're never playing the same thing twice. And it's always in three phases. You have, Level one, level two, you get through that, you have an interim area where you can heal up, and then you go into a boss fight. It's always the same thing for the most part. And it's cool doing that loop and just exploring each of those areas. Like, you know, we did, on the first night, we did a really cool snow area that I didn't expect was in. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's neat discovering that world and then going back to the hub world, cashing everything in and seeing what's there. The fun part is the stuff that surprises you that you don't expect. Like when we're in the middle of wrapping up a dungeon and we're going back to cash in all of our stuff and craft new weapons and whatever. And there's a big alert that says, uh, Hatsune Miku will be performing in 15 minutes in the shopping plaza. We're like, all right, well, I guess we got to hang out for that. Um, and like there was the one night we played, I literally, I, I hopped on, I want to say maybe seven or eight thirty. And I was going to play for maybe like two, two-ish, two and a half hours or so. And we got to the point where it was like almost 10. And we each had like some of the dailies to knock out. And I was like, oh, well, if we just do this and this, I'll get my dailies for the day. And that lets me level up the 
the season pass a little bit higher. Like it was like, if I just did these two things, I could check off like seven things from one of my many different lists of check off things to do. Right. So we did that. And by the time we wrapped up that and we're cashing in, it's close to 11 and we finally get back. It's now like 1105. And once we had crossed that 11 o'clock mark, it was like, Hey, a concert will be starting soon, but they always happen on the half hour. So we knew it was going to be 1130. I was like, well, I'll hang and wait for the concert and then I'll go to bed. So we get to that. It's not Hatsune Miku, but it's another like Vocaloid anime girl singer thing. Uh, she debuts a brand new song that hasn't been in the North American version of the game or maybe not in the game at all. I don't know. People are going fucking wild in the lobby. Everyone's spamming all these weird things on the screen. Everyone's dancing. We're just sitting there having a great time and you can hit... Uh, like a, a key to focus so it kind of like changes and it's a very cinematic like you could just watch the performance we're watching all of this and it's just nuts it pulls back and everyone's jumping and screaming and emotes are flying off and everyone's spamming a chat with encore 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 and I, after seeing the Hatsune Miku concert the week before uh it, it kind of like went out and it, just one song and done this everyone's spamming encore so I'm typing it too just cause everyone's doing it right and it fucking comes out for an encore. I was like, holy shit, it worked. And everyone's like, oh my God, I'm losing their mind. She sings another song. And like, it was just nuts. We all get a buff because we witnessed the concert. So you get this like 30 minute live viewing buff. That's got a little music note next to your uh, character, which didn't matter. Cause I was going to bed. Right. Well then, because we had crossed over and there's now 15 minutes to midnight, there's a an alert that a high power raid is happening and when we had first signed on for the night all of the screens in the lobby were red and mark was like oh i think the high raid the like high tier raid is happening uh we should try and do it and it turned out it wasn't happening well now at midnight it was happening and i was like all right we got the miku or not wasn't miku but we got the the dancing buff let's just do this let's dive into this raid so we go in it ends up being this giant giant like i don't know how many stories high but like this huge massive like it almost looks like a statue um and it's like marching through this map i'd never seen before it's like a it looks like a an ancient japanese town all the buildings and everything and this guy this towering giant statue has like 11 heads on his chest and three on his head and it's just this massive crazy a mass of whatever we all dive in and we've all got the, everyone came from the concert lobby into the raid lobby. We all go into this raid together. Everyone's attacking this thing. We're getting buffs from all, just all over the place. Um, and then like when we kill the thing, there's two big rare, you get these like crystals that drop after a boss fight. There's two of them and we break them open. Almost every item is red, which is the rare drops. And like normally when Mark and I are running through and doing stuff, I would say twice throughout a general run through a dungeon, you get a rare drop. So you might get like two rare drops. That's it. This was like 20, 30 in just from beating this one boss. It was insane. So we do that. And then he was like, Hey, there's still some time left. Do you want to run it again? So we run it again. This time only the two of us load in. So the two of us run it by ourselves a lot more difficult this time. Um, but we still get through it. We didn't get as many rare drops, but we still got some good stuff, right? And I was like, oh my God, that like, it was really exhilarating. Like, it felt good. Like it was a good, fun challenge to get through. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to bed. Like I couldn't go to bed because my heart's still racing. It's like, you know, adrenaline. Um, but uh, we're done. We go back and I was like, well, let me just cash this in. The alert goes off again. It is now time for the second tier of this raid. And I'm like, holy shit. So we run back in. We got to go do it. As soon as we get there, a little pop-up, a little overlay comes on the screen with controls and a, a slight guide, a small walkthrough on how to pilot the mech. And we're like, are you fucking kidding? We get into mechs and we go in. And now that guy we just fought, there's six of him of the same one. And us with uh, 10 other people in mech suits have to take out all of these things. And then we're like, oh my God, we're getting rare drops. Everything's crazy. We're in fucking mechs, which is just, it was super fun to pilot those. And then 
there's a fucking like hole rips in the sky and a giant golden version of the one that we just fought falls into the map and now we have to fight this golden version of it uh and then we take that guy down and just i mean it was just a night like super super cool so it was just this this thread of like do some traditional dungeon crawling watch a weird concert go do a raid like just the i think the variety of this game is all over the place and really i think that's alluring to me and pretty wild uh there was a wedding event last weekend that ended everything's doing wedding events for june that ended fortunately and in its place came the sonic the hedgehog <clears throat> anniversary celebration so now in the shopping plaza the main music from sonic adventure plays there's rings all over the place that you can collect and if you collect all the rings in the lobby then the giant sonic statue in the center starts holding a chaos emerald just a small little easter egg but it's it's like there's just so much like sega love and celebration and then weird shit at, like we played last night and ended up just hanging out in the casino gambling fake money for a while and just talking on discord like it's just really good in that way and di- i think just it's super diverse super weird uh, i don't know <laughs> so funny enough that night where you guys kept going on and on and on i saw you guys in discord i you don't keep discord open but for i guess i had i was talking to it was probably from earlier in the day actually i just never clicked out of it i saw you guys on i was gonna hop in and I was like, nah, it's like 10 o'clock. That's usually when, like, Joe starts winging. Because it's a work night. Oh, yeah. Joe's going to start weighing it off. So um, I, have it in, I, I had Taco Bell. So I ate that. I was chilling in bed. And I thought I was going to go to sleep. But I wasn't tired. So I, like, boot up my computer. Or, like, I go back to my computer. I was going to play, like, a round or two of Call of Duty. And I see you're still on at, like, 1130. And Jesus Christ. Like, I, I, not to join the game, but join your Discord just to talk. I was like... Nah, there's no way. I'm probably going to join and are going to log off at any minute. Play a couple <laughs> rounds of Call of Duty. And now it's like probably midnight, like 12:15. And yep. uh I get out. Like I like I'm I'm actually tired at this point, so I'm going to bed. I, like, you motherfuckers were still going. I was like, dude, god damn. Either this is just... either this is the greatest game of all time or they fell into some weird rabbit hole. It's uh, that's the thing is like it's good because I think there's a lot of it that's still new to us, right? Because we haven't had it in North America. So there's a lot that's just, we're learning it and we're trying to figure it out. It is inherently fun. Like across the board, it's fun to play, I think. Um, I think honestly, when you and I played, I think we both were the same class, the Ranger. And I think playing Ranger sucked on a controller. Like I wouldn't, if I went back to play it on Xbox, I would switch classes to something that's more melee focused uh, with a controller. Playing on mouse and keyboard with the... Um, with the ranger is a lot better and there's a when we played i think a lot of it was like auto lock on this if you hit the z key you can change so it's like a over the shoulder and it puts a reticle that's free moving with your mouse so it's much more mouse and keyboard oriented like it it just feels good in that way um but yeah i i think there's a lot of stuff about it that sucks just like weird just like little tiny things that are like oh this game is so old like the bounties the daily bounties that we do like completing them you can't clear out your thing until you go back to the main ship and go talk to the person that you got it from right like any other game you complete it you just check it off in your thing or it auto gives you the item that you got like no you need to go back and return it like that sucks the fact that um there's you can only carry 20 of those daily things before it's full. Unless you're a premium member, then you can carry 50. Like, eh, there's stuff like that that's just like... And also, I don't know how to become a premium member. I can see where I can get access to my personal quarters for 30 days or expand my storage for 30 days. But I think all of those things happen if you're a premium member. But I don't know if I have to just buy all of those individually to become a premium member or if there's one premium member purchase. Like, all of that stuff is just bad. Like, I, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but also I don't care cause I'm running around in a cool ass <laughs> costume that I got from a scratch ticket, uh, from a fun scratch ticket. Cause you get fun. You earn fun is what it's called is one of the four currencies in the game. Five currencies. I forgot about casino coins. It's, I, I don't, it's a weird game. It's a weird 
weird game, but it's one that I can't stop thinking about and wanting to play. Um, and there's a lot of like Monster Hunter DNA in there too. Like you fight these big cool monsters that have their own attacks and their own whatever. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's really, really, really a rad game that I didn't expect to fall into. I'm glad. I'm glad you're having fun with that. Yeah, it's it's a neat one, man. You have me thinking about playing it, but there's something also inside of me is like, no, don't. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's the one cool thing I'll say about it is like, you and I get to talk every week, but I don't talk to Mark. I, I well, talk to Mark yeah, every yeah. day, but I talk to Mark every day through text, and not that like we don't get each other, but there's a lot that's lost through text, or that you just don't get through that, like, you know, so having the ability to jump into voice chat stuff with him is has been nice just to hear his voice and talk and whatever so yeah that's true yeah i mean we did some of that last night briefly yeah i mean like you know you guys were playing minecraft and uh i was jumping between destiny and fantasy star and whatever like but we got to chat which i think was nice which i think i want to try and do more of like even if we're not all playing something together just like hang out in discord um especially now yeah, I mean, I can, like, I don't have to play uh, Warzone with with duos. I can play by myself if I'm talking to someone. It's just it's so quiet when you play by yourself. I just don't, like, that's the only weird part about solos. Yeah. So. But, all right. So, uh, I guess the ball is back in my court. So, we mentioned it earlier, the black hole that is the social justice bundle from itch.io. Yes. Uh, that $5 that gets you probably... By the time this is over, two thousand games, close to it, something like yeah. that. When I bought it, I think it was like seven hundred, and we looked at it right before recording. Is that like sixteen hundred now? Yeah, it just keeps going. So I mean, and, and it's not all games. Some of it is like original soundtracks and uh, game assets and stuff like that. But the overwhelming majority of it is definitely games. Um, and I got into some of it. So um, some I. I'll just mention a couple of that, but there is one main event, but I'll probably volley it back to you for any quick hitters if you got your hands into this bundle. Uh, I play something called This Call Maybe Record It. It's like, hmm. uh, it's a dumb little like five to ten minute game where he plays a telemarketer. And what got me was like, you are a telemarketer. There is no, you have no emotion. You just sell, sell, sell. So I had a feeling it was going to be one of those like just dumb comedy games. And it is kind of dumb in, in comedy. And uh, like you're calling these people like on this list. And you're just like, hey, would you like some insurance? And they're like, no, get the fuck off the line. You're like, all right, would you like this thing? <laughs> they're like, no, shut up. We don't. Why are you calling this number? You just keep going. And then there's like these little mini games to like deflect the words they're saying so you can't hear them. So you just keep selling. Like, it's dumb. Uh, but it's like 10 minutes and it gets That's clever. It gets kind of funny. Uh, or it, and there's a good little payoff at the end. Uh, if you keep going with it, um, I quickly played another game for a couple minutes called Data Loss. Um, it's a rogue like hacking game, so it's not hacking like terminal hacking. It's more like you clicking nodes and stuff like that. So the premise is uh, you're trying to take down this corporation and you need to go through it by levels. Um, and uh, you the the gameplay is you. Like you, you have this screen; it's blank. But like, if you click, you uh, you ping, and you see these nodes for like a quick little second. Uh, and then, like, some of those nodes are connected to networks. So if you click and infect, I say in quotes, one of those nodes that's connected to a network, you get the whole network um, uh, infected. But you want to get okay. each of these nodes, uh, and some of them are single, some of them are connected to like thirteen others or whatever. So you're like trying to find them and click them, but at the same time, there's a little like red cross here that's going all around. So as you're pinging to try to find these nodes, if the red cross here comes across, you get a penalty. Well, the the gameplay is you want to affect all these things in a certain time limit before you're, you're caught. But if you're getting hit by that red cross here, you, you get like a time penalty, time taken away from you. So it's very quick. Uh, I think the, the, the rounds are like 50, 60 seconds. But once you get to start getting some time penalties and things like that, it turns into 30 or, or, or so. Um, but yeah, like the whole point is to try to make your way up the tower. Um, and then like you get money for completing a level and then you 
can reinvest that money in some power ups. Um, but it's not one of those games where like you can keep those power ups. Like it's a brand new run each time. Each time, yeah, you, you die. So what do the power ups do? Do they like let you? Take so I'm not that good at this game. I found out, and I don't know. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I saw some of them, but like I said, I never had money to even like start reading. Oh, which one makes sense? So, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it was a little like shopping list. It was like four things I saw, uh, but it, the game seemed long because, like, I, like I said, I started at level one at a tower, but like I bumped up to level two, and it didn't seem to go up that much higher on this tower. So there's a lot, there's a lot there if you want to get invested. And then uh, the other one that probably it probably took an hour and a half of my time, uh, maybe maybe a little less. Uh, it's called Silicon Zeros. So it was a okay. puzzle game about, like, the actual, like, building of a computer. And it's, like, learning about, like, like not, like, the the primary chips. So, like, you're trying to figure out these little puzzles of, like, how to make a computer. And, like, you, the story is, like, you get hired by this company, like, back in 80-something before Silicon Valley was a, was a thing. And you start learning about the computer pieces. And you start adding things like, uh, like, ticks for memory writes, um, how to change memory, like, numbers to represent a certain value in memory. And, like, it slowly was building onto all this stuff. And, like, I was getting stuck on some of the, like, the beginning levels, like, tutorial-based stuff. And that was just, like, the first part of the game so it was really it was a unique puzzle puzzle game um it's probably the one that i will come back to but it's gonna be one of those things where like if you don't come back to it soon you're gonna have to restart because they were starting to already throw so many like multi-level yeah you'll forget. systems to it um but no i thought that was that was really clever and like i feel like you can probably learn a thing or two out of it about like computer science so um yeah, I think that's worth checking out. But I'll I'll save my main event, which I played and completed. Um, if you have I've something else, I've seen a couple things like that that are like teaching you actual skills while you play. I, I can't remember any of the names of them, but as I've been scrolling through, looking at this bottomless pit of games, um, there was there's been a few that it's like learn how to code while you play this dungeon crawler or, or whatever. Yeah, um, it's been cool. Uh. I have not really played... I don't think I played anything. I was, like, grabbing a few and adding them to my library, but this bundle, when I first bought it, was, like, so tough to navigate because it was, like, separated by pages. Now it's one free-flowing single page, which makes it easier to, like, look at everything. Uh, It's still a lot to take in, but when I did it, it was, like, 25 items on a page, and there were, like, 16 pages or something like that. Now there's, like, 50 pages. Uh, or there were before they changed it to this free flowing thing. I will give credit to the uh, web designers or whoever is in charge yeah, they, of that website. Yes. Like they have been very transparent. Of like, hey, look, we're like slowly implementing things to make this better. <laughs> like, yeah, like they, we we've heard we we know what you want. We're gonna do what we can. Yeah, so like they they were smart. They didn't like immediately throw it into your game library because they knew it'd be overwhelming. Uh, they knew about the page system thing, but they said like very early on. Like I think I bought the bundle the second day it was live, and they were like, "Yeah, uh, we know this sucks by pages. We're like slowly working at it to make yeah. it one free flowing thing." And now that's live uh, as of us recording, uh, and it's going up. So like they they are slowly but surely like making strides to make this bundle like as convenient and easy to navigate and stuff for you. So. Just give them yeah, time. There's a, a lot, lot better. here. And I think there's been, I feel like if, you know, any sort of like community you follow is going to have a list of like, hey, here's the games we recommend kind of thing, like, you know, out of this bundle. So, um, yeah, I don't know what I played in here since buying the bundle that I could recommend, but there were a few that I had either played previously or saw that were weird that I think are, are neat. I, I think that I'll, I'll talk about two. The one when you and I first started this morning and we were just talking about this before we were recording that caught my attention was uh, Blackheart, which is a Carly Rae Jepsen themed cultist tabletop RPG one shot. So the developer is Colin Cummings. Is what it says. Original rule set written and designed by Colin Cummings. Um, this is, this, of course, the second release in the Carly Rae Jepsen tabletop RPG trilogy following the successful Boy Problems, uh, of which the developer, I believe, took its name. Uh, yeah, you get everything. I think that's the cool thing about this is there's a lot of these 
like tabletop RPGs and stuff like that that you just get the PDFs for. So I had grabbed a couple of these throughout the week and just like read through what they were. And like, I love the visual design of so much of this stuff. This, this one, like just scrubbing through, like I'm not even looking at the actual files, but just looking at like what's on the itch page, the design that they put into the actual like game, the PDFs that you'll get and all, it's just so cool. But yeah, you use a Spotify playlist and a PDF with a fucking D6 and you play a tabletop RPG. I, I, that's wild and cool. Uh, the one that I have played that is super impressive is Micro Mages, which I think I talked about a long, long time ago. But this is a game developed for the NES that actually ships on an NES cart. Um, and it's wild. The uh, Sandeep, our friend Sandeep, turned me on to this game uh, when he sent me how the developers managed to fit everything that they fit in this game onto a real NES cart. And that was what was impressive first. And then playing it, the game's actually super fun. Uh, one to four player platformer where you work your way. You're kind of like climbing a tower um, in these little stages one by one. But it's... It runs on real hard. I can't like express that enough. Like that part, like you play it and you're like, this is cool. This is fun. And you think about it like versus some of the stuff, you know, shipped on an NES and you're like, how did they do this? And if you're interested, I think watching that, it's like a seven or eight minute, like little behind the scenes of what they did to compress everything and put it on a cart. It's, it's cool. So micro mages, that's my. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff on this that. I think one of us or Mark has played that's been high on. Like, I think 2064 Read Only Memories, Mark, if I remember correctly, has played in, like, that game. I know I wanted to play that one a while back, but I never did. But, yeah. I mean, we are both very high on Celeste, and that's part of this bundle. Um, yeah, Celeste like, is in there. Oxenfree's in there. Yeah, like there's, like, there's so many things that, like, just buying that game, just that game for $5 is a, is a steal. And then you yeah. get all this other stuff. So it's definitely like, I just want for a good cause. And then to like the value is like overwhelming. Uh, and there's so much, I think a lot of the here. assets and the like game making tools and things that you can do for learning, I think is really neat in there as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, it, uh, it's still up the sit, the sale, uh, sale bundle, whatever you want to call it is, um, is still up as of this going up for the rest of the day uh for the most part on the uh, est i don't know what it would be pacific but uh yeah if you're listening to this monday you should be okay yeah if it's past monday june 15th sorry yeah so um definitely i you know it's, it's definitely just worth a, an easy purchase uh but the one thing that i saw in here that was like at a very early one um uh, that became like my thing to play this week uh until i beat it was uh quadrilateral cowboy what is the quadrilateral cowboy so quadrilateral cowboy is like your first person puzzle slash hacking terminal game um it's very like i don't the um the the art like it's very like simplistic very like blocky like the characters are literally just like blocks with like little faces and stuff on them um just to represent but like it it's so it's so weird so um I, like the story there, like there's a little bit of a story and it's, and it's kind of wild you can, but at one point like your your guy grows like a machine gun arm and starts blasting away on mechs like it, it's it's out there but it's a lot of it's a lot of fun it seems to take place in a very distant cyberpunky future uh there's like hover bikes and shit like that you're jumping onto um but no, like the the main gameplay is you're going onto these jobs, and it's usually some kind of heist. You're usually trying to steal something or obtain something or some something. Um, and you go in, and the basis is you walk around, but you you have a deck as part of a, of your uh, inventory. And the deck, of course, is like a computer that's portable. So like you pull out that deck, and I may be looking and at a door, but the UI says like it's door one. So what you can do with that deck. You can go. And um, you log into the telnet 
the you know the the system that oversees that door and you tell the door to open and you tell it to open for a certain number of seconds because most things in this game have like a three second like alarm trigger so if you leave it open for more than three seconds on alarm triggers and you, it's some kind of penalty it could be a machine gun comes out and kills you or something usually bad happens so like you hit door one dot open three seconds and then you're you're on your way but like that just keeps escalating um like all those different systems and your deck is like your best friend in this game but like there's also like little there's like areas where like you can't bring your deck in so like you have to be careful and navigate how you're gonna go through this area without having your deck but knowing uh you're gonna need something so like there's a wait command to all of this stuff so you can tell you can launch your command and it will wait five seconds and then the door will open for three and like it just keeps building all these systems to the point where like you have this little like robot little like remote thing that you can crawl and it can data jack for you from these little small areas and vents and stuff um there is a very there is a very hitman agent 47 briefcase that turns into a rifle that you then can control from your deck so like there is there's a bunch of moving pieces and by the time you get done or by the time you get to the end, like you're just you're you're like putting together all these all these different uh, all these different things. Um, and like I said, it, it like there's a little bit of terminal hacking. It's not like hack net though. It's very just straightforward for the most part. Um, yeah, you're not you're not gonna go like very high terminal level. Like no one's like even knowing like, terminal commands really isn't gonna get you much. Um, it, these have their like this game has its own proprietary commands so. Um, but like tabbing to enter in the rest of the field, like that stuff, some of that stuff like comes in handy, comes in handy. There's here. like that little like inherent knowledge that yeah, helps, but it's yeah. not, yeah. Uh, especially like there's some areas where like typing, like you, you may want to type fast cause you're on the clock you know, sure, sure, stuff sure. like that. So, um, it's, it's having some of that knowledge helps, but like it's definitely not needed. Uh, and it will teach you easily whatever you need to learn. Uh, it's, it's all very, it's all very easy. But then like some of the guides like to, and how they teach you, like everything's really clever. Like it might be like a sticky note that's like slapped on your deck all of a sudden. It's like, Oh, this is the password or like having to go, like you have a note on your heist, like your notes on the heist. So sometimes the answers are in this notebook that you've had, like you've taken notes prior you know, b- to the heist or whatever. So, like, everything, I think, was really unique in the way they set up. It never was very hand-holdy. Um, and so there, was some, there was some points where I was thinking, like, what, what am I not seeing? What am I not doing right here? So it really made me think about each of these environments and how to attack them and, and stuff like that. So uh, I can't recommend It's something that I've had since Hacknet because it keeps kind of popping up on my Steam page because of Hacknet. That I've been looking at, and then finally with this bundle, it just made sense to finally launch the trigger on it. And it, it it's fun. It's a, only a couple hours long. Um, the game can be buggy. Uh, there was one point where I kept interacting with an object that I needed to interact with, uh, and I, the game kept crashing. But the um, <clears throat> the game is very good about letting your level select from the start, and I found that was a fix for a lot of the things I was running into. So instead of hitting continue, just go to the job select and just start from clicking the mission you're on and that usually seemed to solve any kind of issue so um i, I think i want to run through it again because there is a developer commentary linked to the levels if you want to hear it so like i just want to see what some of that thinking was like when it coming up with the puzzle design because some of them like i said they they make you think a little bit especially like when you get to the later missions and you're starting to put everything together um and like you can improve your 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 heist times too like they track your time and stuff so like i said very uh it's very good. Uh, I, I would highly, I would highly recommend uh, playing this out of the bundle. That yeah, that sounds cool. That we had a fun time with Hacknet back then. This sounds like it's going to scratch a similar itch. There's a couple games like that that I've whose names I've forgotten, and they're on a Steam wish list somewhere uh, that I always mean to check out or come back to. I, I think I'm gonna. I don't know when. I don't know if it's this week or not, but at some point I'm going to get lost in a lot of this stuff. I'm looking forward to it. I uh, I did, speaking of sales and bundles of sales, I jumped in. There's like a Bandai sale. There's a Sega sale. There's a Nintendo sale. All on Days Switch. Days of Play still going on. Yeah, Microsoft so stuff so, still going on. Yeah. I pretty much didn't spend anything, but then I think I don't Wednesday or something, I was like, ah, I should do this. So I grabbed... 
uh, Katamari Damacy re-roll on Switch. A, a Ben Bear's favorite. A Ben Bear's favorite. <laughs> um, I started that. I will say that one is like I kept I kept playing games all week long that required so much of my attention and understanding. So Katamari was super refreshing to just get lost in because it's just so whimsical and just generally fun to play. Like when I wanted to just sit down and like have fun and not think Katamari. I got uh, Taiko no Tatsujin Drum and Fun, which you might you've probably seen before on Switch. It's that drum game, and you can actually order a drum controller to play with it, which I think I might get from Play Asia. I don't know. Oh, I think I've seen this. Did Giant um, Bomb play this? Probably. Okay. Probably. It's cool, uh, but there's no uh, playing with the Joy-Con. Kind of is a pain in the ass. Like the. <laughs> The swing detection is very weird on those and very finicky, I've seen but playing this. with buttons doesn't feel great, so I'm probably going to order that drum <laughs> from Japan. Uh, I have become Mark's drumming neighbor, but instead of hearing Led Zeppelin's Cashmere every day, uh, my neighbors get to hear A Cruel Angel's Thesis from Evangelion every day. It's just the theme song to that. Like I start the session playing that with that. Um, I grabbed Super Monkey Ball, or whatever it is, Monkey Ball Blit, Banana Blitz HD, but I didn't start it yet. And then the other thing on Switch, I will just, to wrap everything up, I'm still playing Tokyo Mirage Sessions. It's become just, I'm going to go to bed, let me knock out a dungeon. So I kind of just like do a couple floors and level up. What's cool about this game is I the story's there and it's somewhat intriguing, but really it's seeing how the characters keep leveling up. Like what are the new powers that you get for the characters? What are the new abilities? I've added a fourth option for a party member. And what's neat in this game, you can just swap your party members out at any time. So you can only have three in the party, but whether you're in or out of battle, you just go to the menu and you can swap one in or out for the other. So if you get into a battle, in battle, it's going to cost you a turn, but otherwise out of battle, just swap them in and out. In battle, if you like get in and you're like, ooh, all of those enemies are weak to ice and the only character I have who can use ice is the one that's outside of my party pull them in really quickly and you can do that because you can do those chain attacks when you attack a weakness that like trigger other effects to hit which is cool um and i think there's a cool general balance to power and ability within each setup to your characters that um you get to just apply a lot of like practical thinking when you approach combat i think that's it yeah that's that's about it for me i've jumped into a couple weird things Bri- briefly, not even yeah. really, like I played Minecraft for like fifteen twenty minutes yesterday for the first time, and I think since yeah. nine years ago, like we we set sail Kyle and Sea of Thieves and Mark. Uh, yeah, we I did have, finally do that. I even played Sea of Thieves for a half an hour by myself once this week. Wow, uh, how was that? Uh, kind of boring. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, I mean the fun of it was like sailing around and us like. Getting fucking jumped by those dudes you know, who stole the one our thing shit. though is I kind of if you only play that with friends like I do recommend getting into it at least once because like I don't know like whenever I say sail with you guys and I I've been cool with it it's not like I you know I'm pissed that you guys usually like have an idea of what to do like but I got in I was like oh what the fuck do I do <laughs> like almost. yeah yeah no like. And like, much... I didn't even realize you could tr- like join trade outposts and stuff like that. Like I, I joined one by accident. I got an achievement. I was like, oh, look at, oh shit, look at this. <laughs> like, yeah, because there's stuff like where and then you're leveling up the, the trade post stuff. Like I see yeah. some of the skeleton now to this game. Yeah, when we like would kind of play for a while together, and then I would jump in by myself. I would forget to turn the sails because I'm so used to someone else. Is it's it's Matt's job, right? Like Matt's the sails guy. That's the lookout guy. Like when you're playing by yourself, even on a small ship, like it's all you and you need to control all of it. It's it's wild, but yeah, like yeah, I, Sea of Thieves is fun. I fortunately never had to get into ship combat, but like the sailing by myself thing, I kind of got. Like I'm, I am a fucking pro at docking a boat right where you want it. I will, I could tease yeah. it. Oh, I'm that's, I'm good at that. I found I found that out. Uh, but yeah, spot. no. It, it's weird, like, having to be responsible for, like, all right, well, shit, like, the sail's in my way. Oh, all right, I am heading this way. All right, let me go check the map now to make sure that is the island I have. All right, yep, there it is. All right, let me run back to the wheel, just tilt it a little bit. Oh, the sails are kind of yeah. off. I can get more wind. And just doing it all by yourself when usually, like you like you said, you can usher that out or someone's usually just on top of it. So Yeah, by the time you're thinking of it, someone's already doing it, usually, which is cool. 
so yeah, uh, no, that was that was interesting. Like, I, I, I don't see me, I don't see it having lost long lasting legs, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll hop in every now and then just to fucking because it's fun and the great water graphics. Like, that is still like yeah, pinnacle. I could, just, I could of look water. at that water all day. <laughs> Well, why don't we go look at some water for a couple of minutes and we'll come back and we will talk about the PlayStation 5 and Destiny and all sorts of news from the week. Sounds good. Be right back. EA has made some announcements this week about the future of Need for Speed. You think Manu's coming back? I think that's what the the series needs. Uh, look, they've been having a tough time over there. Um, but Need for Speed Heat uh, is getting its final update. The final update will include cross-play added to the game and it's the first EA game that's including cross play so this is a step forward it seems this is happened on June 9th already so Need for Speed Heat it's the first EA title cross play between PC PS4 and Xbox One remember when PS4 just didn't play ball with that yeah everyone forgets to hear all that people I know people don't forget but people forgot about that like that was a that was something to protect the kids yeah, that was what it was. And then EA has also confirmed that Need for Speed is in development by Criterion, which that was kind of a weird thing, right? Like, because Criterion started working on other stuff, they were they were doing the Need for Speed games, and they got kicked over to Ghost, and Criterion's been doing other stuff. I think they're doing that Star Wars game that a trailer is going to drop for today. They're like. I don't know, um, but they're back. They're no longer the burnout people that were the Need for Speed people that are not the Need for. But now they're now they're the Need for Speed people. For now, for now. How do you feel about Need for Speed? I, I mean, it just doesn't. Everyone talks about what Underground, Underground Two. Mm. It's just like you're so far removed from those entries now. Like, it, uh, like I don't know. You say Need for Speed, and I don't. I think I'm at the point now where I don't react. Yeah. At this point, I'm looking for them to impress me instead of being, oh, well, it was Need for Speed. You know, it should be interesting. It's now like, all right, well, you got to show me something good. Yeah, they blur into the background. I don't know. I've been having more fun going back and playing PS2 racing games than looking forward to whatever new racing games are coming. Except There's too much one. bullshit except tacked one. onto them. We'll get to huh? later. So, except for one, and we'll get to later. I already forgot. GT. Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a different story, though. Speaking of different stories, new Metal Slug game aims to tell a new story this year. Um, so, SNK Interactive has announced the game is slated for release within 2020. This is a new, uh, a new Metal Slug game. And then there's also a new mobile game that has not yet been officially announced that is due out at some point soon as well. Do you ever play Metal Slug or, or mess around with those at all? I messed around with them. I always get um, that and Contra mixed up. <laughs> honest, to be completely honest. Mm. Um, I mean, they're both like shoot 'em up side scrollers. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, I messed around with well both series. Honestly, Contra and Metal Slug. They're, I mean, they're fine. It's usually, usually those get really hard and I, that it hard quickly, and it turns me off. But yeah, you know, they're fine. Uh, well, we'll see what happens there later this year. I don't. That's it's a small little blurb, but yeah, I never played a ton of those. I know Metal Slug Three is like super impressive from a pixel art perspective, but other than that, I don't know much about those games. Speaking of returning franchises, Alex Kidd in Miracle World is getting a deluxe edition upgrade. This is not done by the same people that did that Monster Boy upgrade, but it looks very similar in scope where it is the original Alex Kidd game 
but then kind of with a whole brand new art style. Um, they're adding some new things too. There's going to be new levels, um, alternative boss fight mechanics. They are having classic modes, so you can go. I don't know if it's a swap on the fly thing. I think it might be. But yeah, this was kind of out of nowhere. Like you think of Sega and where Sega has been and is going and Alex Kidd often gets forgotten about cuz Sonic took its right like Alex yeah. Kidd was kind of like their first attempt at a mascot that didn't really take off so then Sonic took its place and we know where that went right like still the face of Sega in so many different ways but yeah I don't know I'm excited about this I ended up uh speaking of that sale earlier I bought Alex Kidd on switch because the sega ages version is on there from m2 that's i think it's like four bucks right now so i I never i think i played alex kid once on that sega genesis collection for ps3 because you had to get so many things in a level to get a trophy and i wanted the platinum in that genesis collection and i got it but yeah um so that'll be out in q1 2021 stay tuned for that Bloodstained Ritual of the Night has sold 1 million copies worldwide. Uh, We got a little video from um, Koji Igarashi with a thank you. And then there's a roadmap of more content to come out throughout the year for that game. They're still adding stuff to it. I don't... I have not gone back to any of the stuff they've added. I know they added like a second playable character, things like that. Did you ever play? You never went back to that one, did you? No, I, I went through that first like little boat area, but uh, and I got to the boss and I died once. And I was like, eh, eh. It's when you're ready for that itch to be scratched. It's, yeah, no, it, it, it good. looked good. It's just I I have not had that Metroidvania scratch in a in a while. Um, last time I had it was when I was playing Super Metroid. Right, right, right. I forgot you did that. Capcom has announced, speaking of sales, that Resident Evil as a series has exceeded 100 million units sold worldwide. It's impressive. It's, yeah. I mean, there's a shit ton of Resident Evil games if you go to the expanded library past the numbers and the remakes, but uh, eh, it's still impressive. I mean, think of harder games. Like, they, they are never the ones to sell, you know call of duty numbers like they, they just don't they just they don't appeal to some people like me like i i want to play a scary game but like i i know I, I i can never get myself through it so very impressive and it just shows i think a good track record for usually for resident evil yeah yeah it's cool the series is still alive there's a lot of stuff from capcom and from other you know classic franchises like that that have not stood the test of time like alex kidd <laughs> that uh yeah i'm happy it's still around i feel sorry i'm kind of like dancing around these news stories here before we get to the big meat of it all uh, it's kind of we talked about the sc- that star wars trailer will be dropping today for star wars squadron uh it kind of like started to leak out there was the weird upload to PSN a couple months back. Then there was the weird leak this week from an Xbox store website. Uh, and then finally EA was like, sup, we'll see you Monday. Yeah. Uh, Remedies confirmed the control is coming to PS5 and Xbox Series X. More details on that later. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the marquee ray tracing game back in the day, remember? So Right. I say back in the day, not so long ago, but yeah, uh, I think it. I think that's an important game to come over to kind of showcase that and see. I think that's going to be one of the good DF videos that shows the power of these compared to a PC with like a 2080 in it. Yeah, I agree. That that makes sense. Uh, this kind of broke late Friday, uh, but AT and T is looking to sell. So AT and T, first off. Merged with or purchased? Was it purchased? Warner purchased. Brothers. Yes, acquired Time Warner in 2018. And 
now at and is looking to sell off Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment, the whole gaming division. Um, so it looks like from this story from CNBC that the company's looking to sell the entire kind of like gaming division as a whole to one buyer. It doesn't look like a THQ thing where like... It's not a fire sale. Know, yes. Where they're going to get this one, this, this is going to get that one. Um, but right now, according to this article, Take-Two Interactive Software, EA, Electronic Arts, and Activision Blizzard have all expressed interest in buying the gaming division. Uh, no deal is assured, nor is it imminent, two of the people have said. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is big considering the properties there within. Um, well, that's the thing. Do the properties come? Yeah, that I don't know because it's like there's there's a lot of weird stuff with this where they own Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers owns DC Comics. DC Comics owns Batman. So you sell the gaming division, which includes WB Games Montreal and Rocksteady and the history of those games, right? The future of these upcoming DC property games. Like, we know that, that, that Warner, Brothers, Warner Brothers Montreal is making that Batman game <laughs> in some capacity. Do we know? <laughs> so do you sell that? I, I, I think know. that's... It, there's the- probably a... That's the unique Weird part is, I mean, yeah, that, that game and division has their own properties. They've, they've acquired or created their own way. Like Mortal Kombat, like that, you know, that's not WB stuck, right? That's, I feel like that's Nether Realms. Well, it was Midway. Well, I, that's what I've said, acquired or created yeah. their own, but yeah. Yeah. So, like, I feel like that's something that's easy, it's easy but yeah, like, when you think about all, the comic part of it, like... What what happens with that? Is that like a licensing thing that's going along with the purchase? Is the language one? Well, one this came from a source. Is as this isn't supposed to be like public knowledge. They didn't even disclose who they were because you know for safety of their job. But yeah. um, you know, if this does happen, I think it's going to be important to read through the the language of that of that deal to see what that means for those properties. Um, well, this too is like. You know, Warner just launched HBO Max. Yeah. There's a lot of there was a lot of weird talk around when an HBO Max got announced last year and DC Universe announced that it had canceled Swamp Thing before it had aired Swamp Thing. There was a lot of weird stuff about like the future of DC's digital property. Like there's there's all this weird stuff with the upper management at Warner specifically in a post AT&T acquisition time Warner. So I don't know. So now maybe this is related somehow with you saying that, but like I think I just read that some of the DC movies, the uh, the more latest ones that are being pulled from HBO Max. So hmm. I think I read that right. That's weird. So that's something... I don't know. What the, I know that like a lot of the DC Universe exclusive shows are starting to pop up in other places, like um, with all of the delays in filming. Like because right now when all of this stuff broke out in March people would have been starting to film for the fall seasons of shows. So because of that, CW has picked up Swamp Thing and will play Swamp Thing from DCU on CW as a new fall show this year. So it's like, there's weird stuff like that. I know the Harley Quinn animated series is now on sci-fi and somewhere else. Um, Doom Patrol debuts in like a week or two on DCU, but also on HBO Max. And season one is going, I don't know, it's, it's weird. Is there a particular company you would hope that they land in? God, I mean, of those three... Who were the three again? I forgot. I don't have the article right in front of me. Take two, EA, Actually, and Activision no, Blizzard. Thumbnail. Of those three, I, don't, I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't want any of them. But then again, like... I don't know. I don't even know what out of that stuff that I even care about, right? Like, Mortal Kombat, yes... Scribblenauts was cool, but they haven't done the original developer of Scribblenauts moved on to other things, so they're not, you know, doing those anymore. And the Batman games are rad, but it's been so long. I just who's CD Projekt Red 
releasing Cyberpunk through? Themselves? Is it themselves? Because I don't know if it was the ports or whatever, but WB was their publishing arm for The Witcher. I'm pretty sure that's all self-published. I might be wrong. I don't know. I think just kind of glancing. So uh, side note, I mean, this podcast is going up, but as we're recording it, there's like a day's worth of announcements all happening. Like the Gorilla Collective thing is happening. There's the PC gaming show. So I'm sure there's going to be some stuff slipping out that we are not going to cover here. Uh, But I think we should jump into the big two from the week. Yeah. Let's jump in. Let's do some Destiny talk, Matt. Uh, We talked last week that Bungie announced an announcement. And now we have seen that announcement. Um, So... God, I don't even know where to begin with this. I guess the big thing is they announced the new expansion coming this fall called uh, Destiny 2 Beyond Light. They announced the expansion coming next year, which is Destiny 2 The Witch Queen. And then they announced the expansion coming in 2022, uh, Destiny 2 Lightfall, although that is a working title. So... I think the big takeaways here is that they're trying to make Destiny 2 more what they call uh, building a viable future in Destiny 2. So they talk about the next three years of Destiny content that they've got planned out loosely. And there's not a lot of detail on the future stuff, but it's pretty easy to see that they're going to slowly add three new subclasses to this game. They announced they're adding one new subclass this fall um, with the new expansion. And it seems like over the course of these next things, they're going to kind of bring darkness in as a counter to the Guardian's light as a way to power your character. What they're also doing, because this game is right now on PC, this game's like about 96 gigs, I think. They talk about how the first thing in their building a viable future in destiny two announcement is destiny two is too large to efficiently update and maintain. Um, so they don't want to build a destiny three and leave destiny two behind. They did that with destiny two when they ditched destiny one and all that stuff is gone now. Right? So what they're doing is they're creating something called the destiny content vault. And each year they're going to cycle older, less actively played content out of the live game and into that vault. They'll then, when they're ready to, unvault activities and destination content each year. And they'll kind of like polish things up and then unvault it, as they say, um, to bring back old raids, bring back old content. So what they're doing this year is they're going to bring back the Cosmodrome from the from Destiny 1, along with its Three Strikes and the Vault of Glass raid, which... I think that's the raid that people still talk about and that's love, the first right? one. Yeah. Um, this fall, they're going to take Mars, Io, Titan, Mercury, and Leviathan, and all supported activities, strikes, raids, all that stuff, into the vault. And the thing it talks about is that, like, some of the stuff, I think it was Mercury was one of the numbers they gave. Uh, yeah, Warmind. That campaign, uh, only 0.3% of people played it. Uh, at all in the last season, but it's 5% of the install size, right? So it's like, it, it does suck that, you know, if you're jumping into this game and you wanted to go from the beginning to the end, you know, in release order that you might sign in this fall and there's content that's not there anymore, but the number of people who are actively using that stuff versus the install size, like that's a big difference. Um, but I think that'll also help them shape the, you know, the progression of the game a little bit better and make them think more about what content goes into the game versus what doesn't. So they keep adding about 25 gigs of story stuff or of content generally to the game. And that's the thing you got to remember too, is the maps are so big are so like, you know, 
gorgeous. There's a lot of music. There's unique music in every area. There's unique enemies, like all not in every area, but there's just all that stuff that needs to go into it. Um, they wrote that as of the writing, Destiny 2 has nine destinations, 40 story missions, 54 adventures, 42 lost sectors, 17 strikes, 31 PvP maps, 12 one-off special activities, seven raids, six gambit arenas, three dungeons, and then all the quest patrols, public events, and all that stuff. So it's a huge game when you think about it. Now that it's free to play, there's like all this other stuff that goes with that with like how do you bring on someone in a free to play state and carry them through this stuff. So I think they did a cool thing about like laying it down and saying what the future of this looks like over the next three years. You know, they, they have a long term uh, plan for this. Um, and I personally, I think it's cool that they're going to trim down because I opened up that map this week, jumping back into Destiny after this announcement. And I'm like, man, there's too much shit. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I don't, what's the next thing I have to do? So when the new expansion hits this fall, you'll be able to go to Europa, which will be a brand new destination, an unvaulted Cosmodrome that they're like, you know, adding new art assets to and polishing up so it's cooler. And this will be big because PC players have never played Cosmodrome. Um, the moon will still be there. Tangled Shore will be there. The Dreaming City, EDZ, and Nessus will all still be playable places. Um, I don't know what I'm missing. I, I know. I mean, the, I there's the big piece about the expansion itself and what this current season is. Um, I did jump in, uh, and you jumped in too and saw it. Uh, but there's the black pyramid ships are approaching that we saw at the end of destiny two, three years ago. Um, and now there's one like just on IO and Eris Morin, who we followed through the shadow keep campaign kind of disappeared and you have to go find her on IO as she's interacting with this pyramid. So you get closer, um, to the pyramid and you're kind of fighting stuff. There's the tree of life. There's, there's a lot of shit going on in this, this game, but, um, this season that they're doing right now is leading into the upcoming expansion. So we have the season of arrivals right now. It seems as the black pyramids come on. Um, and then this fall expansion, like you get to wield the darkness as a subclass, which will be rad. I think my big takeaway from watching that event, the one thing I'll say this and we can close up on destiny talk is, uh, Luke Smith saying that last year they came out and they were like, Hey, we're going to build, basically FOMO content, right? Like you, you're going to look at someone and be like, Oh, they have that thing that they got in season 10 that you can only ever get in season 10. So there was armor and drops and things like that, that you had to play at that time, had to do this very specific thing. And it was never like easy stuff. Like you had to like grind for things. And he flat out said in this, like that was wrong. You can blame me. We're getting away from all that stuff. Cause that was the thing. Like I played through that campaign last fall, loved it a lot. And then thinking about everything that I had to do to keep up with the game was just way too much. And I was like, I'm going to go play other shit. And now like hearing that they're pulling back on that a little bit, I'm much more willing to jump in and give it a shot. Yeah. I've been thinking about destiny uh, more in the last like two or three weeks or whatever. But like, I just know not even just like from your experience lately, just like, the last time I got on, <laughs> there was just shit everywhere. There was notifications yeah. and markers and hey, to the point where the UI was just like, where the fuck do I go? Like, which one <laughs> applies to me at this very moment? So, like, uh, I just know that that's going to happen. I really, that was the first time I launched a game since I had Shadowkeep installed, quite honestly. So, like, I know I got all of that stuff still. Uh, I think, as as I've been thinking more about a way to approach it, um, I think I'm just gonna like, do the whole thing. I was just do. I was kind of doing for The Witcher, where like, I'll I'll watch. I'll give some YouTuber a click for a 20 minute video that just explains everything that's going on. Uh, and then I'll at least have the story basis for what I'm going into, and then from there I'll just kind of start doing the stuff that I want to do. Because I think that's part of it. Like I don't know, like. What point is the point 
where I need to go to in the story if I kind of care about the story? Or or is that just an optional thing for the event that's going on now that doesn't apply to me because I still really should play Shadowkeep? For, like, that's yeah. the stuff I kind of want to knock out. I, I think really... they do, if I remember correctly, they'll put a big old red marker for the story on the moon. Like that Shadowkeep expansion stuff. Yeah. Because that should be where you have what you have next, and I think you can just kind of jump into the moon and follow the markers there. It's honestly, I feel like that's the easy part because you still have that. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing now because, like, I don't have a story beat anymore. Now I have this quest line for the season, but like, I know there's like post story stuff from Shadowkeep that I didn't do that I don't even know where to go to access it, and that's a problem that they started to solve last year and they said again like we made a lot of good changes we think but it also still sucks so we're gonna keep changing so i'm happy about that i thought it was interesting that schreier tweeted and summed along the lines of like remember this would have been activision you would have been looking at maybe a destiny 4 reveal or, or something like that yeah i mean for real like it's a good thing and that's a scary thing about that warner brothers story we talked about right like i don't any of those companies, like any of those three, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't trust Activision. EA like loves to acquire then shit out developers. Yeah. Like what dev will close because they acquired four billion dollars worth of uh, WB stuff, right? And then take two because they acquired it because they wanted the Batman license and they didn't give a fuck about you know what I mean. But they couldn't just say like, no, we don't need that developer, we don't need that IP, but. And then take two. I mean, they they just make shark cards and make money. Speaking of which, I guess uh, that's a nice transition. Take two had a great announcement to open up our PlayStation Five event. That's right, Matt. Um, Grand Theft Auto Five coming to the PlayStation. That was the worst opening to one of these I've ever experienced. So just I think it- like the Wonder Book year was better than opening the PS5 event with a PS3 game. So, to put it in perspective, me, you, and Mark were all on Discord watching it together. Yeah. And i had never seen you get so mad at something that just seemed obvious, and I was glad we kind of got out of the way. Part of me was like, I can't believe we're leading with this, because usually cause we all like the fantasy book a, a conference, right? It's like, oh, yeah. if I had these games, this is how the order I would put them in, right? And yeah. I like to do the sandwich. I like a good bread at the top, yeah, a big old piece of meat in the middle, and then that last little savory bit of the sandwich right there at the end. The best is that is that it's the sauce on that bottom bun that puts everything together and that, that just ends the conference on a bang. And uh, that was not a good start. That's not a good top bun. <laughs> no, they used a fucking shoe for the top bun. An old ratty shoe for the top bun. And the best That's not to discount GTA five, but goddamn dude. The best how, part I wanna know about how much that Rockstar was, paid for that. It's the PlayStation reveal. Blah blah blah. And the entire thing had a PS4 in the top yeah. left corner. Uh, that was just I said it too. I remember my exact words. This is actively turning me off from watching this. Like that it was just like, come on, dude. Um, uh, but then they rolled right into Spider-Man, right? That yeah, but first... I, I was going to say, like, I just want to know, like, how much money the Rock City, or not Rock City, I'm sorry, Rockstar yeah. pay to, like, be at the front of that? Or, like, what happened there? But yes, like you said, like you just said, they came and like, everything now is PS5. Yeah. Yeah, which was great. Um, we got a look at, uh, I think it was like 20-something games. That seems that sounds on on the money. It was twenty if you include GTA Five. Um, so I mean, standouts. What's what did you walk away from? What, what's the game that you're like? Um, I don't have the list of games, but the ones off the top of my head, um, Spider Man Miles Morales. It's going to be, and Schreier kind of confirmed that it's going to be more of a standalone expansion It's type of thing. It's not number two. It's going to be very much Well, not like even a, expansion, but more like Lost Legacy. Yeah, that's exactly or what I was going to compare it to. Like, yeah. 
yeah. it's going to be very much one of those. Um, I think the key part of that is it was dated for holiday 2020, so that might be the thing that is launching next to the console uh, from studios, uh, from PlayStation Studios. So uh, yeah. I think that's the marquee grab. Very freaking excited to finally play Demon Souls and not have to pull out my PS3 and not have like non-active servers. Um, I know that was just a trailer. There was no gameplay. But we don't even know what the remake, any changes to it. But like after coming off of Dark Souls, you know I haven't played two or three. Uh, I don't see me even playing them anytime soon. But like I am excited to you know, have that. I'm sure it's going to look really good on a PlayStation 5. And, I mean, unlike unlike all of From's other properties, Demon's Souls is a PlayStation property. So yes. you're probably going to need to play it on a PlayStation 5. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, I can't go without saying Horizon 2. Horizon 2, uh, I really love the first one. I kind of want to... I, I, the, the cinematic trailer did nothing for me because I could honestly not tell you... I, I couldn't tell you what the first game was about <laughs> at this point. Like, I remember some yeah. story beats, but I'll, I just, as soon as they said the old ones, I knew right away. So at least yeah. I remember something. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, it, it, I'm glad it's coming. It, it makes sense. It seemed obvious. I, I want to see gameplay. I want to see what the what the next evolution of that game is besides just elephants. Yeah, there's a turtle now. Yeah. Uh, they're really hiding that too, man. Like in the write up for this on PlayStation blog, it is just Horizon Forbidden West. The logo has a two embedded in there, but it is Horizon Forbidden West. No colon, no anything. Um, I walked out of that thing. I told you, I think on Discord, but Project Athia from Luminous Productions at Square is like something about that just looks so cool. The way that like the characters like cloak kind of like billows in the wind, just uh, something about that game. It's got a, a really interesting aesthetic to me. Um, outside of that, I think that uh, Ghostwire Tokyo. I'm excited about it. I did not realize it was going to be like Mirror's Edge first person style, um, but I that that was exciting to see. And um, I mean GTA Five, just that's got to be probably top. No, um, Odd World was a big one for me. Like that was cool seeing that game finally in motion. Uh, still no date for it. A game is supposed to come out so many times, and uh, I don't know. But you know, that was a nice start to the conference. Uh, of course, a uh, a site favorite of ours, one that requires a hammer, Hitman Three. I think yes, I got a big pop out of all of us. Uh, that's coming soon. That that would be real soon. That'll be in January, and yeah. that's coming to PS5 and PS4. So that kind of gets me to something here. Uh, did this sell you a PlayStation 5? On day one, I should say. I should add that caveat. All right, well, I'm like, going to asterisk. you need this box this fall? I'm going to asterisk, asterisk this, saying, like, I was probably buying a PS- PS5 no matter what on day one. The launch lineup... Eh? Yeah. Like the yeah. Spider Man game is not going to be the 30 to 40 hour adventure that I got. It's maybe 10 to 15. I can see it. L- okay, hold on. Let me interrupt you there, though. That 30 to 40 hour, though, how much time of that was spent with loading times? <laughs> no, but how much of that was spent with those dumbass, like, go to the lab, fly over the city, and collect seven things? Like, how much of that stuff could they maybe strip out that would have gotten it to just a good core story? Like, how much of that 30 to 40 hours was cutscenes, story progression, stuff that was... Because, like, all that stuff around the edges is what set Spider-Man back for me that made me, like, not want to finish it. I like that game a lot, but, like, having to collect... Go to uh, James Franco's Secret Labs and... You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I get it, but like, I actually enjoyed all that stuff in that game. Like, I know, like, it didn't push the genre forward, but, like, I just like being Spider-Man swinging around the city so much that I did not mind swinging yeah, it was fun. from point A to point B to, to do the thing. And the combat in that game is so good. Like, I I don't know. I So I never, like, I never even thought about, like, oh, man, this slog. Like, yeah, maybe at the very, very end when I was grinding for the Platinum, it got to me, but, like, the... Uh, 
the organic way I was doing it when I was, you know, progressing through the main story, I, I, I enjoyed all that. So, like, I wouldn't hate to see some of that stuff here either. Like I said, you're not pushing the genre forward. I know that. I mean, it's it's like your Ubisoft checklist thing that we all like to, to mention, but, like, I didn't hate it in this game because I like right, playing. Yeah, I like playing Peter Parker so much. Um, All right, so then you get Miles Morales this fall. There's your launch game. Yeah. What else do you got? <laughs> like, I, it, I, like that that can't get on PC. That may look better there, right? Like that's yeah. that's the thing. Um, but you know, I'm gonna. It, it's tough because there's not much coming that's going to be exclusive to that thing. Uh, I think Assassin's Creed is probably going to be a buy for me this year. So, like, you know, that is a possibility on that console. Um, I'm trying to think, like, what else? What, like, we, we still don't know, like, the, some big fall potentials, right? Like, you know, we still don't know. Well, I mean, we don't know what WB really is doing at this point. But like, we don't know what some of those studios are doing. Uh, and they're yeah. going to make fall. We don't know. <sighs> I'm trying to think, like. You know, Destiny, Destiny is cross save now. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, so the way they're doing it, they, that was another part of Destiny's announcement, is when you, they have cross save still. Um, but then if you buy your content on PS4, you get the game and all the content on PS5, and PlayStation players, regardless of platform, can play together, cross play. And then next year, their goal is to do full cross-play across all consoles and iterations of the game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that was kind of what I walked out of this from. Like, I want a PlayStation 5. I've owned every, you know, generation of PlayStation, and I will get this. But will I get this this year is a different question. Or, you know, the, like my answer to that is not an immediate resounding yes. Like, I did it for PS4. Like... I bought PS4 day one and I played Resogun. And when I was done playing Resogun for the afternoon, I turned on my PS3 and played the Elizabeth DLC for Bioshock Infinite. Right? Like, yeah. That was that was where we were with that. And this, it's like cool. I'm there will be some stuff to play on this PS5, but like, mm. yeah, I you know, um, I mean, it's not going to be much to, much there. But what I appreciate is. You know, if a, if a game's not ready, it doesn't seem like no, somebody's going to yeah, push yeah. it out the door, which is which is good. Like, we don't have a day for Demon Souls, which kind of sucks. Like, that would be a great freaking launch game. Like, you know. I, that, that or Ratchet, right? Or yeah. Gran Turismo, like any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah Gran Turismo doesn't have, even have a date, like a year. Like, I, no. like, I don't know if that's just because they don't know they can make 2020 or or not like I don't like some of those things might be because they're not sure they can make 2020 their aim was to be a launch thing or a right. launch window right. but I don't, I don't know I, don't, I really don't I really don't know I mean this whole pandemic I'm sure has thrown a wrench into a lot of people's plans even the consoles itself um, but yeah no I like the ball the, the thing that with this conference though yeah, this stuff might not be coming soon, but it, we know some of it is coming. We know probably is probably going to be impressive. The ball's back in Xbox's Microsoft's court to yeah. see what their first party studios are doing. Yeah, because we saw so we saw nine PlayStation Studios games. We saw Spider Man. We saw Horizon. We saw Gran Turismo. We saw Demon Souls. What else? Ratchet and Clank. What am I missing? They they list nine of them here on this PlayStation blog thing. And hold on, let me open up this one. Oh, Sackboy, a big adventure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Returnal, that Housemark game. Apparently, Destruction All Stars. They're calling a PlayStation Studios game, and then Astro's Playroom. Where are the other games? The, the, Which, the new ones seem second party to me. Yeah, they do, yeah. for sure. But that's still, I mean, it's a big lineup for PlayStation, for first party stuff. But that's like, I feel like Xbox can counter that pretty well next month with Halo, right? Like that is, I, I'm not trying to discount anything we saw here at the PlayStation thing, but Halo is going to be 
big potentially, or it has the potential to be bigger than any of these. Yeah, yeah. And then there's at like launch, the invisible at stuff. At launch, at launch. Sure, sure, sure. Deal. There's the stuff that we don't know about too. Like, obviously, I've been screaming about a perfect dark thing forever, and whether or not that's real or not, like, there's the potential that happens. But we'll probably see that fable, rumored fable game. That one we know is pretty strongly rumored, and that's Playground, which they kind of made an RPG in Forza Horizon 4 just to test the grounds for it. So there's that. There's other first-party stuff that I'm curious to see what Xbox does. But I I think what... Going into this PlayStation event, I felt like I knew we would see Spider-Man. I knew we would see Horizon. Everything else... And, and I knew we'd see Gran Turismo, right? Like, those three yeah. things. Uh, the Demon Soul stuff had basically been confirmed through leaks, so it was not a surprise, but still a surprise. And then Ratchet and Clank, like... That was a coin toss, right? Like, whether or not we saw Ratchet and Clank show up right now or next year. Because Insomniac's not going to get away from making Ratchet games. Um, not now, anyway. No, yeah, especially not now. So with with that, right, it was kind of like... It's a good lineup, but you kind of knew all that going into it. I want to see, like, what are the other PlayStation Studios doing that we haven't seen yet? And what are the Xbox Studios doing that... I feel like Xbox, we can't really guess. That's we the kind thing. of can. Yeah, and that's what I was, you know, I'm, I was going to get at here, where like PlayStation, you PlayStation is kind of built this brand over you know four generations now, where there's they have a whole like a, they could pluck an IP out and say here's a sequel and it, it gets hyped. I don't think Microsoft has that amount of IPs to do that with that are still in good faith, like. I don't know. I I don't. I can't see. I mean, you you would get excited, right? But like, um, I I don't think I don't think the hype level for a conquer would be like that big. <laughs> like, uh, like you're gonna have your your Forza, right? You're gonna have the car game. Got to have the car yeah. game. First party car yeah. game too. Um, you know, you're gonna have Halo, but I I highly doubt you're gonna have anything from Gears ready to go for for this. You just had Gears Five. Um. Yeah. I'm, I'm struggling to think of you said fable i mean that's a big one i'm not a big fan of fable but that's a big one i'm not either but yeah that's a big one i mean like banjo that'd be a big one not for you or i but there is a true a, i'm just a I, like feverish i feel like the that. pulse check with ukulele kind of maybe kill some of the momentum there but i, I understand banjo. ukulele is not banjo i understand that I mean, Banjo is a possibility. I mean, you think of it, uh, PlayStation's going to have two two mascots. Maybe not at the start, but eventually. You're going to have Sackboy back, and you're going to have Ratchet and Clank, yeah. and this new this new chick. She's going to be a new mascot. Oh, right. Ratchet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, I don't know. Like, PlayStation hit all the things they needed to hit. They got the car game. They got something to launch with, it seems like, as long as it makes it. Um, got a couple mascots. You got a big marquee game that is in the pipeline that is going to probably be 2021. Um, I don't yeah. know what else you want from that conference. You have a couple new IPs, but there's not from the first party studios, which I thought might be was a little weird, but it's fine. Yeah, that honestly, that was the thing. I think like I'm not disappointed. I think this was a really good showing, right? Like compared to remember the last time Sony showed up for an E3 time frame with some announcements. It was that weird ass Death Stranding, Last of Us Two, or did, was it even Last of Us? Yeah, uh, Tsushima and what was the other one? Remember, it was like four games that they did on stages with the guy playing the flute, yeah. and then they paraded all the. Remember, like I don't even think Death Stranding was part of that. Was it? I think it was. Or you just Either got way, trailer. We didn't see gameplay there. No, 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 not gameplay, not gameplay. But it was like another another trailer, and they did, I don't know. It, that was their last thing. So for them to come out now and like, hey, was here's Horizon? 20 plus games. Who? No, that last game in that conference. Was it Horizon? No, because it was after Horizon came out. This was 2018. Uh, I thought it was before that. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't remember. Hey, we got RE2 out of that, though. Was that that year? Yeah, RE2 was that year. 
Yeah. Uh, E3 2018 was Last of Us, Death Stranding, Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, and is that it? I guess that was it. <laughs> they had dreams between the segments. <laughs> right, right, right. God, what a weird. Either way, this was, you know, a much stronger showcase yeah. than what we saw then for sure. Um All right, the console. What do you think? Well, wait, are you going to talk about Resident Evil? I feel like no one's addressed the See, that was another thing, man. This is why I fucking hate leaks so much. <laughs> Because, like, we saw it, and yay, cool, Resident Evil Village. But, like, the second that we started to put together, like, this is the Resident Evil trailer, I could stop watching it. Because I already knew everything, because I read everything. Leaks are exciting, because they start to string it together. But when it comes around to the official announcement, it's like, you know, it sucks. It's Because it discounts all the work that they've done to put this cool thing together, right? And then, I don't know. It's exciting. I'm not, it's just... I don't know. It's like when someone tells you the whole plot of a movie and you sit down and watch the movie, it's like, yep, cool. Knew that. Got it. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's snowy. There's witches. There's werewolves. It seems like a, the Her right shoots, step forward. For what Resident we assume Evil. is Mia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a, so the one exciting thing about resident evil eight that has come up. <laughs> Have you heard about this? Uh, Leon Kennedy semen meme. No. Well, come with me on this journey. Uh, Mark sent this to me. So this is by way of our friend Mark. Um, I'm just, I'm putting that out there so that uh, we can blame him. There's a meme that has erupted where people have started to write in the narrative that Chris wants Leon to impregnate Claire carry on the Redfield bloodline forward. So people have started to go back and interweave this whole narrative through the actual narrative of the game. And it's just a dumb thing. So now with Chris showing up in this trailer and killing Mia, it's like, no, 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 everyone needs to die. I need to find Leon. Where the fuck is Leon? He needs to get Claire pregnant. And there's just a dumb little like thing, but he was sending me stuff. Like someone like rewrote a whole like letter to Leon about like, and it's in Resident Evil style of, like, breaking into a locker and, like, whatever. Like, here's the combination for the code. In it, I've left an engagement ring. I need you to carry it to the top. Like, it's just whole thing of just, like, yeah. So that kind of made the non-surprise of RE8 surprising again. That'll be out next year, 2021, uh, PS5, Xbox Series X. It's cool. I'm happy Capcom is has that franchise in a place that you know, can carry it forward. That's, yeah. I'll have to dig. I'll have to investigate that more. <laughs> Just type in Leon Kennedy semen into Bing and you'll have a good time. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm afraid to do. <laughs> uh, I'll get Mark to send you some information. <laughs> Don't worry. But yeah, so we got to see our first look at the consoles. Uh, disc version and a discless version. I was shocked about the discless version. I did not. That's like that was a real surprise for me. Yeah, um, I did not think we were going to have choice. That's one of those things that no one even mentioned. I think that that's why. Like we with Xbox, you keep saying talking about like Lockhart and Scarlet, and well, Scarlet is Series X, but like no one knows what Lockhart is, and it's still being thrown around. So we could assume that there's going to be two Xboxes at some point, but. I did not see two PlayStation 5s coming. Uh, I would love to get my hands on the digital one, but I don't know that's going to be possible because one, I think, is going to be slightly cheaper. And uh, I think it's because of that, it's going to be harder to find. Yeah. Uh, the look... I didn't know what to think at first, but I think the more I look at this, I think it looks sleek as hell. <laughs> I like the two-tone. I... I, I I like it. I like I like where, I like the white words white at. I like the black words black at. I like that it has this little blue hint to it, kind of bring it over a little bit of that heritage from the PlayStation yeah, a little Four. Bit. Uh, and the PlayStation Two. 
I, you know, it, it's different. I think it's the first box that's uniquely shaped that's not a Nintendo console. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, and you know, remember last? I'm just, I'm just having something different because last generation we had a rectangle and then we had a slanted rectangle. Yeah, it's the same. So like, same thing. Um, yeah, these are two different looking consoles. Like, I look at what I still have out on display, and it's like, at the end of the day, this is a fucking box that gets shoved under a TV. And, and then you know, everyone's talking about what it looks like now. Like, you know, once you, ha- yeah, it's there, but like, I'm not looking at the console while I'm playing Spider Man Miles Morales. I look at things to make sure they're turned on the way they're supposed to be turned on, right? Like, yeah, that's it. Um, Hell, you don't have to do that. The PlayStation Four beeps when I hit the PlayStation button on my controller, so like. Things are firing yeah, but, off. I really don't even look at it. But I, you know, like the ones I have over there, like none of them are remarkable. You know, the Wii U is a rounder Wii. The PS3 is a smaller version of that bigger version. Uh, it's just, yeah. Um, I think what is telling is when, um, when you look at the generations stacked and this thing's going to be big. Yeah. It's going to be big. But you know how people figured that out, right? No, I know. I just uh, I thought it was Sony maybe released that. No, that picture you sent was from the community who have uh, used the... Because Sony hasn't shown a, a picture of this like to scale. So people figured out its scale based on the USB ports on the front of it. They were able to then figure out how big this thing must be and then size compare it against the other PlayStation generations. Um, That's where yeah, this, everyone it says, you know, shits on the internet. That's the internet coming together in a yeah, great dude, way. That's, that's, a good, that's a good future right there. This, this looks like something that someone in 1987 would have drawn as a video game console in 2020. So I guess in a way this fits, right? Like it's... It's very Alienware, like like Mark said it yeah. when we saw it. Oh, that looks very Alienware. Yeah, if you were watching an anime from the 80s that took place in 2020, this is a video game console, which is cool. Uh, I wish it were gray and not white, but that's just me. Maybe yeah. by the time I buy one, they'll have a gray one or yeah, a black one. I'm just, I was concerned... When the controller was white, about how white this was going to be. I figured it was going to be white because it usually matched the controller. Um, yeah. But no, like, yeah, it's white on the outside, so you're going to see dust and dirt and stuff. But I like the, t- I really do like the two tone design. And I like that stand. That's st- I didn't realize how that stand comes into play with the horizontal. I think that's yeah. really clever. Um, and then, of course, Jim Ryan got his Johnny Ive on explaining why it looks the way it does. I fucking loved, loved, loved it. <sighs> Jim Ryan. The only thing he it didn't say was aluminum. Him. He did? No, I said the only thing he oh, didn't did. say was aluminum. Everything else is a very this is a very Johnny Ive description of an Apple product. I think the other thing that's telling about this, so they debuted this with, we got to see the two different iterations of the console, the new camera, a headset, and a remote. So what thing about this are they going to be doing with a remote? Because, like, the PS4, they never really gave a fuck about showing you what a remote would look like for it, or I don't know if they even sell one for it. But this, like, to show it as part of the debut of the console, that's interesting to me. I, I'm not going to look in too much into it. I know, I think the PlayStation 3 had a remote as well. It did, it yeah. did, but that made sense because it was the first Blu-ray player, right? Like, why this? Why now? Who the fuck needs a remote in 2020? I'm just curious, like, what's the other side of this that we haven't seen yet? I, I mean, I'm sure, like, you know, this, this stuff was emerging when the PlayStation 4 was released, but, like, there's more, there's now more than ever these apps for viewing like you know netflix was around you know when the ps4 came out yes but like you know like hulu's rise i think was slightly after the ps4 uh and you now you now have hbo max hbo now hbo like you have all these media i think that's why you show the remote you just show as part of the family and it can be like essentially an apple tv at the end of the day which these consoles can be now if you really want them to be um 
I, I, I'm not looking too much into the remote. They always PlayStation always has a headset for their consoles, so I'm not looking into that. I think the biggest surprise, honestly, was there was a disc on one and not the other. Yeah. And, of course, we knew we weren't going to get pricing, but I think that uh, what's the price difference going to be? What is the price in general? I'm very, I'm still scared of what that price is going to be. Jim Ryan, in that same interview where he was going to Johnny Ive, also said about value over cost efficiency. So that scares me. There's a lot of language, a lot of deliberate language that starts to set the tone for this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, his wrap up speech. I think you said it best on this because I was saying to you, like, well, I don't know. Maybe I will get the disc one because what if I can pop a PS1 game? And you're like, no, dude, he just said we believe in generations. You're not getting backwards compatibility on this. And I think that, I think the way he said that, I think the way they, they frame this, I mean, you can start to figure a lot of this stuff out. And it's, it's a weird, I don't know. It felt like we started to get to a point when crossplay was happening where this stuff didn't matter so much but this console head to head like you can tell they're both getting kind of hungry for it and they're fighting for it it's it doesn't feel as uh divided as 2013 did well i think because 2013 was very one-sided right because once oh, yeah. xbox made its move xbox it was made... like that's the thing xbox they got dumped on from the start it wasn't even a competition they opened yeah. their mouths and it was over yeah, and then it got war- it just got muddled and worse as we went into it, and as Sony was just Jack Tretton bringing out his dick on stage, like, <sighs> yeah, like that 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 was that generation. Jack Tretton put the fucking nail in the coffin during that conference. That's all that was. There was it wasn't a competition. Like you, you just said it. Yeah, this I all the details aren't out yet. And that's I think that's why we haven't had the the big stands and the big fucking console war yet because there's still information yet to be revealed and they're doing it in such different ways that it's hard to even compare them yet so i think once you see price that's when you're going to start seeing all that shit yeah it's true anything from that playstation event we didn't hit on that i'm missing or forgetting about no nah, i mean there was a couple cool little things like uh that that what was that safari fucking bugs next like that looks like unique bugs next yeah good, yeah there was some stuff like that. Deathloop looks to be something worth playing, maybe. We got the next game from uh, the... Uh, oh, what's that top-down game? What? Mark. Mark. It's a Mark game. House Mark? Yeah. No, not House Mark. No, Mark. Trademark. Mark. What's that game you fucking love? That we... Dash. I like, too. Solar Ash? That's the game, but what was... The, oh, yeah. the new one from... Yeah, Hyper yeah. Light Drift. Hyper... Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, you already said about Ghostwire. Uh, uh, yeah, I think you kept yelling at me about Project Athea being Final Fantasy 16. I said, no, one dude, wants you want to talk Fan- about Project Athea? Athea? That's not Final Fantasy 16. No one wants that as a Final Fantasy 16. No, I don't think it's Final Fantasy 16. I think it's something more than that. But the fact that it has Project in the name means that that game is not out for 22 years or so. Well, that just means we're going to see it each conference just like the uh the one that came out on switch right 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 oh boy but grand theft auto yeah. 5 yeah yes that's that's the really the with the playstation 4 watermark in the corner god uh well what with a... that it, it that at the very end there um i know we were shitting on it at the time but they did say about it was it coming to plus that sounds right. Yeah, it was I don't coming to plus, remember. and if you log in and like once a month, you get like a million dollars for stuff. So, um, if you want to hop on that train, it, it was sometime I think next year though, or it was coming up this year. I, I, for, there was something in that conference though that for for something coming up, it's it's a okay. So it's a standalone version of Grand Theft Auto Online available free for three months exclusively on PlayStation Five. Yeah. Basically. GTA 5 is coming over, but also GTA Online standalone is coming, and they're going to put it out for free so you can try it, and then you have to buy it to stay in P- GTA Online. My guess is that that means GTA 6 is on its way, and the online portion of this will just be its own standalone thing. You know? Yeah, that would make sense. 
And this um, is no different than what Grand Theft Auto Five just did on Game Pass. It came and went, and now what? RDR Two is on there now, right? Yeah. I don't know, but the whole fucking hey, we're really excited to bring this to you for free on PlayStation Five and give you all this stuff and blah blah blah. It's kind of like when they say, like, hey, if you buy one Samsung phone, we'll give you six for free. It's like, all right, well, what am I getting? Right? And also, what do you want me to buy? Because <laughs> that's all it is. It's yeah. You get me in the door with this, but you're just tricking me into something. Well, I mean, we saw it when we logged into Xbox when, like, it's just so overwhelming and you have to grind so much just to get a fucking thing that then leads to, you know, that's just the first stepping stone into the the end where it's going to take another 800 hours to grind it out, or or for the low, low cost of one shark card, you can get there almost immediately. Or you could play Fantasy Star Online 2. Any of your junk gear, you just feed into your regular gear to level it up, or you break it down, you feed it to your mag to level up your mag. And if you mag? participate in that... Wait, yeah. mag? Is that coming to PlayStation 5? <laughs> confirmed <laughs> it'll be inside gta online any disappointments from the conference before we go um no ape escape that was a big letdown uh honestly that was kind of my disappointment was maybe just nothing i think that's why like i know like i'm leaning into it but like project athia was exciting to me because I had no idea right yeah like, everything else in here, it was like, yep, cool. Like, I was exciting, right? Like, I was excited when I saw Spider-Man, when I saw uh, Gran Turismo, when I saw Resident Evil. But it was all like, yep, got it. Like, it just, you, thank you for checking that box. Thank you for meeting my expectations. Um, but I think the possibility of what could happen is the exciting stuff to me. And that's where stuff like Athia was exciting. That's where even some of those weirder games that, like, didn't stick with me as much... Um, but like the one, the other one from Capcom, um, Pragmata, right? Like it was like, okay, cool. You, that was I didn't expect that. That seems exciting. So the fact that we didn't see anything like that from first party was disappointing. Because I again with first party, I knew we would see Horizon, and I knew we would see Spider Man, and I knew we would see Gran Turismo, and there were the other ones. But like a lot of those are second party, as we said. Um, and it's not the time for some of those studios, right? Like, Tsushima's out in a month. Last of Us is out in a week. Uh, there's stuff from a lot of first-party studios that's not going to make it out. But I am excited for... I think a lot of these franchises... And even Horizon, right? Like, Horizon's new for Guerrilla, but it's old for PlayStation at this point. Because they put Aloy's, Aloy's face on every piece of marketing they've done since 2017. Um, and I, I know that at some point in the next year, we're going to see another God of War thing. And like, it's cool. And I'm happy because if I were into those franchises, I would want more of those franchises, but I'm bored. Right. Like mm. it's the same thing. Like when Nintendo first showed off Splatoon, it was like, what the fuck is this? And it ended up being so cool because it was new and it was weird and it was different. If it, if Splatoon had been a Mario game, it, we would have forgotten about it already. We would be like, man, remember that weird ass Mario game they did where you shot guns at each other and painted the ground. Like it wouldn't have worked. So I don't know. I like what these studios get to do when they get to stretch their wings, and we didn't see that yet. It's the debut of the console, so there's still, you know, seven, eight years for us to see what the studios can do with it. It just, it's kind of just, my disappointment was that we didn't get to see, you know, what was your, what were your A-teams doing to prep for this, right? It seems like a lot of the A-team stuff is going into sending the PS4 off with a bang. Um... And not kicking the PS5 off. Uh, also, they should have made the console black. But other than that, not a ton of disappointment. How about you? Anything that you were like? No agent and no wild. I think those are my two. <laughs> well, you still got the Ubisoft thing next month, so Michelle Ansel might show up for you. Uh, no, I, you know, I agree, but I think at the same time, like, I think you, I think you're seeing what Studios is doing, right? I think they're gonna. Their their A marquee studios are going to work on the A marquee properties that they know will sell copies. The risk are going to be with studios that are trying to prove themselves through some kind of second party deal, which much like how From with Demon Souls started, right? That whole genre yeah. started pretty much from that 
from that game. And they went off and did whatever, and you know Sony missed the mark with that one. But I think that's where I think they're just going to try to double down on that. Like they'll take the risk with the second parties, and if it works out, they'll either a keep working with that developer or that developer will move on, and they can keep the property and make the A studio then make a sequel that because they know it will sell um, at that point. I you know I I I don't see I don't see a big risk being done from the 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 a studios you're you know the ones that when you think of playstation studios you you, you like the first five you think of uh, i don't you don't see many risks coming from there this generation i can't remember the last time they did that like i'm trying to think like at the launch of a, like launch of ps4 didn't have any big new ip like ps3 was maybe it right you had resistance you had lair you had uncharted right like not at launch but like those things were announced and we kind of saw them coming um but i mean the, but go back yeah the i think the console price was a big part of it but remember this ps3 got up to the slowest of slow starts and because you know I, and i think you know that's not the reason i still think the console price and them coming out and saying you need a second job like it was just bad pr all around but you know i, I just think they didn't have like that game either um, and that's no, why yeah. you start off with it. And like, same thing, like Gorilla, right? We know them for Horizon at this point on PlayStation 4, but they launched with Killzone. Yeah. So, and then, and then they went on and they, they did something new, which turned out really well. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. You know, I, I I'm curious. I know, I, you know, I, I know we're a week out from The Last of Us, but I am curious to see what Naughty Dog does next because they usually alternate on their properties. At least they have been the last couple times. And I think the I think the bow has been tied on Uncharted. So you might see something new there, which is kind of exciting. Crash 5. New and exciting. <laughs> yeah, I want to I, I want to see what Naughty Dog can do in a different space. I don't know. Uh, well, with that, what's the next week look like for you? I really don't know. I, 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 more Call of Duty and stuff, but then Friday, Friday's the day. Friday's the day is the sequel I didn't want, but we're getting, and it still looks good, and it's reviewing well. I'm excited. I, I, like I said, I never wanted it, because I thought the first one ended pro- like beautifully i still is still one of my favorite games ever and i hate when one of my favorite games ever and there's a chance of disappointment and the expectations are so high like just not from me but just from everyone uh you know i just hope that it pays off and it plays well and but yeah i would definitely be getting lost in that on friday when it comes out well i think left behind like did a good job of storytelling and and making you care more about the progression of that story although it was like set in a it wasn't after the events of it was during the events of and before but like after not wanting anything else from the last of us getting left behind was like oh wait yeah okay maybe i do want more of this so to that extent i could see two until that last encounter in that game but that's another thing yeah that was a pain in the ass that's that, that's the first thing i think of when i think of that game not like the evolution yeah. of ellie's character i immediately just think of how painful it was to go through that last encounter I the only thing when I think back to Left Behind, I think about the Halloween store. That's what always sticks with me with that game. Like that's my first gut reaction. Like that's good. I'm glad you think of that first. It takes a couple thoughts for me to get there. (laughs) Um, yeah. Well, if you want to explore uh, the world of the arcs with Fantasy Star Online two, I will be on that throughout the week. I'm sure. Um, I've got an engagement to go to after this, but I am, I think I'm going to sneeze and sneak in some destiny two today before getting out of here. Uh, that one it's, it's early in that one, but I, I can feel that one starting to creep a little bit. I, I don't think I can. That's the other part of this. I know like the last of us is coming and my work situation. I think I'm finally going to start going back here soon. So like my, my time is going to be limited. Uh, so I don't know if destiny is like the thing I really want to jump into. This was yeah. like five weeks ago. I would have thought about it, but no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Who knows what the world will bring? And honestly, look, I'm not. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna, just lightly, just super light. 
they said that that ARMS character would be coming to Smash in June. We got to have a direct here at some point. Oh, Unless they just keep tweeting out Paper Mario announcements. Huh? Are you predicting a direct? No, I'm not predicting one as much as I'm saying something's got to happen soon. And when it does, I expect it's probably going to be some more stuff to buy out of that and play and explore. So I don't know. I Yeah, did we know the fall for Switch? No. Yeah, you gotta get, we're going to get one soon. Uh, dude, until they tweeted out Paper Mario two weeks ago, we didn't know Paper Mario existed, you know? So, we don't know past July. Their big game this year, their big announcements before Paper Mario were Xenoblade Remake and Clubhouse Games, both of which are now out, and Origami King will be out in four weeks. So, yeah, we don't know... Anything. Oh, when's that Dang and Rampa creator game coming? Like That's two soon, weeks or right? something. Yeah. Okay. I was gonna say if that was this week. I may have played that too. Nah, it's, I think it's the week after. So. Oh, Ring Fit! I'll be playing Ring Fit this week. You will be playing. Yeah, I'm. Ex- I can't wait to hear your experience with Ring Fit next week. That'll be a good one to look forward to. Well, if you like this episode, you can find it and the rest of the episodes on thefreecheese.com over on the podcast. You can follow us on Twitter. The Free Cheese is at some free cheese. Matt is at MattyX131. I am at the free cheese. That's it. That's all I got. Yeah. You know, we we, we did it. It only took two, we did it. two hours, 40 minutes or so, but we did it. Well, it'll get cut down a little bit. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll see you next week with another one of these. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, listener, for listening. Bye.